Flint Ruin came back uh, through the blackout. Uh, Tony, would you mind reading, uh, giving us a roll call? Jimenez? Corrales? Here. Yep. Present. Roscoe? Here. Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Here. Bully? Here. Hamas? Here. Jones? Here. Licardo? Here. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Um, so I really interrupted Jen Loving when she was in the middle of her answer. I'm sorry for doing that, Jen. I was just worried we were going to lose you anyway. Uh, Jen, are you still with us by any chance? Okay. Uh, I may have lost Jen, but if she returns to us, uh, we'll put her back in. Henry, if you're able to hear me, she may not be in the participants' room. If she's out in the waiting room, you may want to pull her in. I'll see what I can do, Mayor. Okay. I think Council Member um, Esparza had the floor. I actually wanted to delve a little bit more into the um, financial assistance. So we doing rental assistance and financial assistance. Um, again, that's uh, being able to get cash in the hands of folks. Councilmember Sparza, we're having some difficulty hearing you. So if you might be able to adjust your microphone. That could help. Uh, uh, you hear me better now? Much better. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, so my question is uh, really around, are we also offering financial assistance as well as rental assistance to get cash so desperately needed um, in our community? Council Member Esparza, this is Michelle McGurk from um, the team, and we are focusing on rental relief because of the timeline and the documentation that's required, but it will, with our partners, it will marry nicely with their philanthropic funds that have the flexibility. So our coronavirus relief funds are focused specifically on rental assistance. Yeah, and so I just really wanted to emphasize that point. I know the need is so much greater um, than what we can, oh, let me turn this off because I can. So much greater than what we are providing locally. We really need, desperately need the federal government to step up and address these issues. Um, so I think um, Jennifer Loving is on now. So my question is, how can we combine the city funds, which go to rental assistance, how is that going to combine with some of the other efforts to get, to really get money out to people? Um, because they don't, they have nothing right now. Thank you. Hi, this is Jennifer Loving. Uh, Council Member Sparza, I just wanna make sure you're directing that at me. How are we going to combine? We yes, have Jen. great. Yeah. So uh, again, I'll say what I said before the outage, which is, you know, we don't have enough money to come close to what we need to do. However, what Sacred Heart and the team has been doing and will continue to do is assess all the families individually and pay rent. And if they need help with food, that's why we have private money. We'll try to do the creative things that we can do. The but again, we can only help so many people. I think you all know we need hundreds of millions of dollars to really deal with the crisis that we have, and we don't have it. So, some families, hundreds of families, will get helped exceptionally well, and many, many more will not. Private donors give, but um, again, one, we need the federal government to step up, but we also need some of our local philanthropic donors to give because our funds have strings attached. So uh, thank you for uh, explaining that a little bit more. 
Well, and, you know, because of the mayor, because of the community foundation, because of uh, the work that we have all done, we've we've raised a lot of private money. And that's what we've been using to give direct financial assistance to families since March. We'll continue to use what we have left. We're going to be augmenting uh, with private money to be able to assist grassroots grantees outside of the San Jose area so that we that we're trying to have an equitable distribution. But, you know, it's not enough. Council Member Sparza, this is Andrea. Um, I just want to reiterate in my comments um, that the philanthropic partners and the Silicon Valley Strong um, efforts at the beginning of the pandemic, um, you know, were were very valuable, and we need to revisit that and continue that, and that will be a part of our our strategy in terms of um, letting them know about the city's investment and trying to again figure out how to leverage. Um, and as we, you know, speak to the county about, for example, their community health and business engagement strategy, we will seek to leverage our investment and really be smart because to Jen's point and $25 million we know is um, a drop in the bucket as it relates to the overall need. So um, we're trying to be smart, be intentional about where it goes and create a, create a story so that we can go back um, and continue to seek philanthropic support. Thank you. And, and then uh, just to double check, so um, Dave, the uh, is it next week that our government relations team comes back, comes to us? Uh, yes, I believe that's true. I could just check my notes really quick. I think that's what we said. Um, hold on a sec. Yeah, so next week we have, yeah, the state legislative update is scheduled for 3.1 next week. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Uh, other council members, uh, Councilman Reynolds, your hand is raised. It, it is, uh, Mayor, and um, Council Member Sposer just um, sparked another question that I had and I forgot to ask earlier. And that is the, um, the exemption rule that we were able to um, benefit from during the summer um, for our recreation preschool. Is there any way that um, our legislative um, support or um, I don't know, through whatever other requests uh, to apply for that exemption as long as the coronavirus um, uh, it, as long as we're sheltered in place and children are at home, you know, with school, could we once again receive that exemption so that we can have full day care instead of the, the part-time care that we are um, restricted to? Um, I might be the best one on that one, Councilman Marinas, John Cicerelli, Director Pierinas. Um, we are working towards that. We, we do think um, there may be some potential legislative or orders, health orders that might help us. So we're exploring on that, but we are gonna run out of time. You're right in this year. Um, we only have so much time. That's why we're only able to get with our, with our full day, you know, 10 hour sessions. We're only able to do 15 weeks because we're limited currently. Um, so that is something we're going to continue to pursue. Jill, I don't know if you wanna add some of that. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing that I think one of the things we want to do immediately when this program is up and running is identify what options we have in terms of leveraging or um, influencing the decisions made at the state level. Because that's the that's what's really preventing us for extending the, the day long licensing exemption that was in place. And the other thing is I know some other cities um, are also interested in this and San Francisco, they're interested in both um, pursuing a, a long going license exemption that could be tied to the emergency order. Um, and then the second piece is also they are actually considering what it would take to become licensed for daytime service for older kids. So it's it's not quite as stringent as I understand licensing for zero to fives. 
but that's another um, option is to really for us to understand what would it take to get our sites licensed so this is in a ch an issue in, in the future right I, I think this is a moment to maybe make some changes legislative changes and ask for yeah. folks uh, for help from our legislators uh, to actually make these changes on a long term beyond this emergency uh, because child care is that part of those emergency services if you will um, so I appreciate that um, that was the last question that I, I had. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, just a question more to uh, more about the child care. I'm just curious about what the obstacles might be in terms of licensing. Um, if we were to try to use seed money to help providers uh, actually start child care of their own in their own communities as part of, say, a, a a neighborhood co-op of sorts, uh, or even a rotating childcare. I know that that's obviously an informal arrangement that already happens in some neighborhoods or some apartment buildings. And I'm wondering um, first whether they're given the licensing requirements, whether there's any emergency basis, for example, for enabling those kinds of arrangements without somebody to have to go through all the same requirements if we've had some other basic criteria for the providers, i.e. they had to be themselves parents or something along those lines. Has there been any, I'm sorry. There's been discussion in the, again, the, the preschool set, the zero to fives. I think there's probably a lot known about that, those options. But really, I have, I personally haven't been involved in the, um, the discussion of the what it would take to license in the older ages. And I think it's really worth finding out and finding out what the different um, sort of license exemptions are and what they can get, get us. Um, because, you know, obviously we have programs that we could offer. And this time while the schools are closed is such an unusual time for our families. And it's hard to understand why there wouldn't be more flexibility. So I think what we'll do, we've already kind of highlighted this as a as a sort of intergovernmental topic for further um, pursuit, but but as a, at a city level with the, you know, with all of the city's kind of influence behind it, and maybe partnering together with other cities that are trying to do the same thing. Thank you, Jill. So, is there some exemption we are well aware of for children under five? The exemptions for under five are, are similar to, to what we know for the older kids and that they, you know, they have limited weeks in which they can be um, engaged in a, in a row and limited number of hours per day. But the, the restrictions around becoming licensed are much more strict restrictive, right? So it's the, you know, the size of the plumbing and the locations of everything and the spaces for the, the care providers. And what my, again, just my cursory understanding and just starting these conversations was that it is, it could be easier for us to achieve a license, um, licensing in our city facilities, or maybe as you're suggesting in partner facilities or with partners who want to um, pursue something like this. Okay. I, I know you're being, everybody's drinking out of a fire hose right now, so I don't want to just throw another thing on anyone. But I guess the concept I'm exploring, as you probably know, is one that we know arises informally in lots of communities. And the great constraint we have, both we don't have enough money and the money runs out in December. And if we want something sustainable, something sustainable might be how we could create many of these child care cooperatives throughout our city where parents who know that they're working five or six days but could offer child care on that remaining day could essentially rotate uh, those days with others and the city could maybe play some convening role and perhaps creating a platform for people to be able to communicate clearly for the city to be able to convene uh, and and perhaps uh, to some limited extent even certify but but I, I know there's a lot of work there and I'm not here just to go suggest it uh, but you're nodding your head, Jill, so I'm guessing it's something you've kind of poked your head around before. One of, the, one of our goals was once we get this program up and running, we know we had 15 weeks 
to learn as much as we can and influence that decision about potentially expansion of a waiver, um, allowing the licensing exemption to continue, but if not, to have other solutions in place. And also it's nodding because we were actually considering a co-opt model at the King Library before COVID with students uh, from San Jose State and trying to figure out how to blend that with a public program. And so we did a little research about the, co the licensing around co-ops too, or the license waiver around co-ops. So I can unearth that. So we can commit to doing that research and trying to elevate that um, so that the conversation can be had at the right level. Okay, well, I appreciate your willingness to explore it to whatever limited extent you have time. I, I know you've, everybody's working very hard right now. I, I also just wanted to clarify because I, I heard from staff a desire to explore and continue this conversation with the community. I, I know that the direction in the memorandum suggests you would come back with a plan, presumably exclusively for money for childcare. And I understand that the point of that direction. And I just want to understand from staff, Michelle, whether if you hear through the, the, the engagement with the community over the next two weeks, hey, but can we also have money for this? This is really, really important. Uh, is that something you would want to be able to bring back to us? Yes, I, I can answer that. You know, our, our recommendation was that we take a little bit more time and collaborate with the community you know, we had told them we would come back to them. We've only had one meeting and get their additional input about how the remaining $2 million should be allocated. We know that more rental assistance is a priority. We know that child care is a priority. We know that employment and training is a priority, but we felt it like it was important. We want to really listen to the community and have a meaningful conversation with them about the remaining two million um, and child care, you know, maybe the real need. And so, but we need to touch base with the community, listen to them. And I think it'd be good to have a little bit of flexibility to then come back with, with the recommendation. I also think there's some technical details that we're going to need to look at in terms of how the CRF funds could be used for child care. Okay, I guess I just asked that the maker of the motion would consider well, clearly there's a primary direction for child care, allowing some flexibility as we hear back from the community and understand better whatever the federal requirements are. Is that acceptable? Absolutely, Mayor, I, I, I agree with you. Okay, and the seconder, Councilor Davis? Yes. Okay, great, uh, thank you. Uh, I don't have anyone else who'd like to speak, so uh, let's vote on the motion from Council Mayor Reynolds. Let me just share my screen real quick. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Hamas? Aye. Jones? Aye. Lucardo? Hi. All right, thank you. Um, we have um, one remaining item before we consider all the police items based on the or change of the orders of the day. Uh, the 8.1 is the downtown residential high rise inclusionary housing ordinance. Uh, that is, is there a presentation? There's, there's not mayor, but the Jackie wanted to make a few comments. So if we could okay. let Jackie, yeah. Thank you. Hi. Well, okay. This is Jackie morales Grant. I am the Director of Housing, and I just wanted to remind the Council that the Housing Department, in partnership with the Office of Economic Development and our Catalyst team, are merely bringing forward the policy decisions that you already directed the staff to implement. So these changes were made by you all back in November of 2019, and unfortunately, due to COVID-19, the staff was unable to make these changes until now. So we are simply implementing previous city council direction. So with that, we have no further, uh, my comments are done, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jackie. All right, we'll go to the public now. This is on item 8.1, which is the downtown residential high rise inclusionary ordinance and roof fee reduction. Uh, Freddie Mann. 
everyone has one minute to speak because of our time constraints. Um, hello? Welcome. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, can, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay. Oh, now your device so, is muted. Um, okay. I have a question about the downtown area on the left. On the left side of the part downtown area, I've seen a lot. Okay, Mr. Mann, we seem to have some difficulty with your uh, the audio. Uh, feel free to raise your hand again. We'll call on you. Uh, Blair Beekman? Hi. Um, this item seems like an item that, that how you talk about uh, uh, high-rise inclusionary fees for the downtown area and, and you know, the, the promise that there can be with, with progressive ideas. And I just wanted to remind everybody here that and how to relate to actually the last item. Um, as we're in this time of COVID, you know, we're worried about recession, we're worried about unemployment, and what's that going to do to everyday people, uh, and how that's going to relate to maybe downtown businesses and, and businesses across the San Jose area. But, you know, San, the, the stock market itself is like booming. It's doing great things. It's, it's, you know, making more money than it ever has been. How can that be translated into the day-to-day -day issues we're talking about here in the last item, and how can you know, high-rise owners, you know, accept those kind of uh, statistics and, and that kind of thinking, how we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Soto? Good evening, Council. Um, I'm reading from a Spotlight article. It says, the city desires to encourage high-rise development that will add new housing units, attract additional employers, increase transit use, that's a quote by uh, Nancy Klein and uh, Jackie Morales' friend. While the city, while the city fees are not the sole reason for development and feasibility in the downtown area, they are a contributing factor. There's, it's it's almost like there's like there's there is a tale of two cities. There's one city that is talking about economic development, uh, the feasibility of of uh, of the viability of downtown, and then at the same time you have these issues of poverty that are actually increasing and they're going to increase in uh, right along with the, the construction of these high rise buildings. And it just, I don't know, there seems to be a disconnect there that I just, I, I can't seem to bridge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Todd Williams. Hello, I have five points. The first point is that I only found out about this from a news article that dropped yesterday. Uh, you must find a better way to communicate these types of proposals in advance. Number two, you currently have an opportunity ha task force in session exploring turning single family neighborhoods into density housing because the housing need is so great so I'm not understanding the need for the waiver. Number three, the state mandated SB 35 affordable housing goal was not even reached and now the penalty waives very important environmental studies. Number four, the goal of having the quota is to spread out affordable housing to avoid concentrations like failed old school project type housing. And lastly, I believe the council supported measure A, the $950 million bond for affordable housing. Wouldn't this waiver essentially transfer our bond taxpayer money to the developers? Vote no, thank you. Thank you, Catherine Hedges. Uh, good evening, Mayor Lagardo and the council. Um, I agree with everything the last speaker said. Um, I was flabbergasted to see this uh, come up. And yeah, we need to, you know, we should not be throwing away our affordable housing money. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, returning to council. 
Uh, Councilmember Pross. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just a question in regards to um, the timeline here, and uh, and actually for for some of the the viewers and those listening, um, uh, you know, for for particular reasons, I did not support this as it came forward last year on the extension. Um, but this was voted on, as denoted in the the report, uh, back in November of last year. So it's not necessarily that this is uh, we're taking the, the vote on moving that forward. Um, we are are now staff is now coming back, obviously, with what they were directed to do um, almost a year ago. And so the question, though, that I do have because I do have some high rise developers or interested developers in downtown um, that have brought, I think, a valid point to my uh, or, or valid uh, concern uh, to my attention. And that's in the, the timeline. And so when you look at the, the certificate of occupancy needing 80% by June 30th of 2025, um, if you go backwards and you kind of see when building permits would need to be pooled, for instance, uh, you could get uh, a building permit not to exceed $13 by June 30th of 2024. And I think anybody would recognize that there's no way you're gonna uh, get certificate of occupancy of 80% one year later. <laughs> so um, the the question here is is in regards to staff on on the timeline of certificate certificate of occupancy. How is is that? Uh, how did staff kind of consider that? Because what it looks like to me is in order to to really uh, benefit from this, you would you would nearly need to be in um, you know at the very beginning, and then other than that, um, the rest of the, the program really doesn't qualify anybody because there's no way they're going to complete a project in in under a year or even two. That's the question. Nancy or Kim or. Thank you, Mayor. I think Nancy Klein, Office of Economic Development. I think Jared may have a comment uh, right after I do. When this was established in November of 2019, there was a date, a set of dates that were specified by the council. And Council Member Prowlis, we agree with you. It, it looks challenging where we sit now. And we've conferred with the attorney's office and we can do no other than to pass this action and any other change in timeline would require a new feasibility study. So council can pass this this evening and then if desired, direct us to continue the work to look at feasibility. But based on the workforce standards language that was passed a year and a half before November, I believe, um, we must follow the precise uh, steps um, that were approved related to workforce standards. So uh, yeah. we, we can't um, make an, a change at this moment. Jared, any other thing you want to add to that? I uh, know, I think that, that pretty much covered it. I would just add, you know, I, I think we agree, um, like Nancy said, with, you know, kind of the end timeline is kind of challenging, but the initial um, two years, you know, I think at least until 2022, you know, gives projects enough time to, if, if they were to come in um, by 2022, gives them enough time to, to complete. And it would also give us enough time to kind of reassess, you know, b before that time. Okay, th thank you for the answer. Um, and as you know, I, I wouldn't mind a second bite at the apple on trying to, to look at the workforce standards and, and getting uh, an opportunity to, to include those, at least on some of the projects. Yes, buddy. Um, and so I, I'm comfortable with moving forward as is. Um, and then recognizing, obviously, that we, we may have to address because the, the certainly the, thank you, <laughs> certainly, um, right, that what we have written up today, it, it, I think we just have to recognize that the, the program itself is really only going to be valid for those that, that get in within the, the, the very beginning. Other than that, that's it. And so it just, I think, uh, you know, I guess that was not considered as it was approved last year. Um, but as we get a second bite at the apple and maybe I'll make another very lengthy argument in regards to the workforce standards and see if I uh, can't get that, something like that to, to move forward with, with uh, an extension again. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Prowlis, and thank you, Jorge, as well for your articulate remarks. Um, 
Okay. Uh, just going back to the question customer Perales asked, Nancy, could you just explain why the workforce standards that we passed a few years ago, why that would confine us from stretching out the certificate of occupancy date if everybody knows you couldn't finish a building in a year anyway? As Thank you, Mayor, for the question. As um, mentioned a little bit ago, when, when the workforce standards were passed, in order to be determined that the action is not a subsidy, right. the work must be determined through a feasibility study by a qualified consultant going through a, a series of questions. And when the full recommendation is put in place, and this was the point we were discussing with the attorney's office until the, today even, um, there isn't the ability to, to make a change, even in the duration, without going back and verifying, redoing the feasibility study. All right, so you need a consultant to say, uh, it's not gonna be feasible in those two years either. Correct. Okay, I think I got it. Okay, thanks. Uh, all right, Councilman Kamis. You, 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 you did ask my question, Mayor, um, but um, I would like, since, since, since that is a very perplexing problem, I, I would love to, to give direction to staff to go ahead and, and start performing that work. Other, otherwise, you know, this is for not, we're not gonna get any projects off the ground unless they're already like, like they absolutely fit the timeline superbly, which means that it's not really an incentive program at all. So um, I'd like to make a motion to do just that. Okay, does that include the rest of the staff recommendation? Council? Yes, yes. Okay, is there a second to that motion? I'll second it for the purpose of discussion. I, I also wouldn't mind taking a look at like projects that are just outside the downtown, you know, so, somewhere around, you know, me and Chappie have written memos in, in a couple times along, uh, you know, public transportation corridors. I think it's really important, at least rail, to look at decreasing fees on those. Uh just a question for staff about the motion. Uh, is it possible to go back to the consultant? And similar to the way we would ask for a supplemental EIR, you have to pay for a whole new one. Uh, you supplement it <laughs> to address some particular specific issue. Um, could a similar effort be made here where we could supplement the study to essentially stretch it out? I know the last study was performed for a decision we made in 2019 before COVID, we're now considering this after the, the bottom has fallen out and we're in the worst recession of our lifetimes. Um, I would imagine there, there, there shouldn't be too much work for a consultant to look at this and say, hey, it's pretty tough. Uh, Nancy, you have any thoughts about that? I do think we're in very different times. I do think it would be very difficult to have um, it certainly isn't more feasible now, it's certainly less. Uh, so we can have that conversation with the consultants to determine what would make sense in terms of a report. And uh, uh, hopefully it's, it's a, a rather abbreviated analysis, which right. would help staff. Um, Jared or Chris, do you have any other views on that? Um, well, I mean, it, it might take us a little bit longer. We, we don't have a consultant under contract right now, so we would need to, to, to handle that first. So that, that would be Okay. Yeah. Well, presumably, I can't remember who did the last one, but presumably whoever did the last one would have less work to do theoretically, but I'll leave that for you guys to figure out. Uh, uh, Council Member Davis. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm interested in the motion that's on the floor, but my question, um, Nancy and Jared, is really about what what could a feasibility study even look like right now? I I almost think it's premature to to ask for that, given that we have so many unknowns, and from everything I have heard, 
if you haven't already gotten financing for your commercial project, it's not happening. Residential, maybe, but even that's iffy. And I would guess for high rise, it's probably a no. Council member, um, you as usual raised some great points. Uh, this would strictly be for high rise residential. Um, there was a so, question that council member so Tanner is financing still even happening for new high rise no. projects? No, not right now. So, so to, your I mean, point, to your point, it may be advisable to wait six months before we would to, to see what else is happening, maybe even a year before we would embark on another study, um, just to, to take a pulse. Um, and we would talk to a couple of the economics firms, strategic economics who did this analysis and others just to ask opinion uh, about timing on uh, data that would be meaningful. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. For any projects that are shovel ready right now in outside of the the designated downtown area that have their funding in hand um if they have workforce standards could we set that fee to zero well the there would be no project if they had um maybe i just want to make sure i understand councilwoman that if a project was outside of downtown, I don't believe they would have workforce standards. Well, let's say they have them in place on their own. They've already done it. Um, so there's a, just to make sure we're all on the same page, I wanna make sure I'm understanding because the workforce standards include apprenticeship, uh, unrepresented workers and folks who are um, formerly um, jailed and there are specific requirements that go hand in hand with workforce standards. So something so beyond a project labor agreement. Definitely. And there are specific requirements for performing the required workforce standards. Okay. So when we've asked that question in the areas where we have not yet done a feasibility study, we would have to do a feasibility study. Okay. So given um, the, the motion that's on the floor, Council Member Camus, did you mean for that feasibility study that you requested to be downtown or citywide? I'd love to be having it expanded to past the city, uh, past downtown. Um, again, I've, I've written memos numerous times about looking at at least places where we have uh, rail, uh, high speed or light rail or something. Um, so yes, uh, and these studies take a long time. And that's why I think if, if we start today, we, we might be able to get it done in a year's time. So I'm, you know, that, that's why I think it's better to, to pass this thing today rather than to, to wait. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting we wait. I'm just suggesting that um, if the study started today, the way that you start a study is with gathering data and there's no data to be gathered. Could I, could I suggest something, Councilor Davis? I think there is data to be gathered and you've been talking about it. The fact that nothing is financeable is data. Okay, that's a fair point. Um, and, I mean, and that was the reality for downtown for years anyway. Yeah, I'm, I'm conditioned that we, we don't, uh, generally, no, no results don't get published. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I take your point, Mayor. Um, so I would suggest to, uh, I, I would suggest because we have this issue and it is not limited to downtown that I would like then the feasibility study to be citywide. If we're talking about high rises, we have multiple places that they could go. And I agree. I agree with you 100%. And that's what I intended in my motion. Great. Thank you. So, so may I ask a question? Please. So the, the council, if I understand, would pass the recommendation that we've got going forward and it would allow the, the potentially allow the projects that are in the queue to move forward. And in the meantime, we would 
um, conduct a feasibility study uh, to that would be high rise that would potentially be citywide. And I, I would want to make sure we coordinate with staff uh, and get back to you on timing uh, for the, the same reasons you normally hear. One want to check in um, understanding that there's no data points and that is data and also in how it meshes with existing workload because they are a, a significant amount of work do take a, a fair amount of work with housing department city attorney's office planning and office of Econ economic development so just want to check in on timing before we would promise a timeline understood thank you Okay, uh, Council Member Foley. Okay, so <laughs> the the whole idea of a feasibility study is um, feels like we're we're going to be throwing money away right now. While we have may have a data point that shows that nothing is getting built right now, if the feasibility study is done today, that's what it's going to say. But in six months, we don't know, or a year, we don't know what the economic cycle will be in uh, residential high-rise development, in commercial high-rise development. There's just so much uncertainty. It, to me, it doesn't make sense to have a feasibility study that starts today or even within the next six months. We need to see the fallout from COVID, the pandemic, the demands on commercial real well the demands on residential real estate as prices start dropping start dropping continue to drop in the residential market the high-rise market in particular that's going to put pressure on properties and there is no good not going to be any capital funds available for these developments so that's a data point today right i get that but why have a study today for a projection of affordable housing fees in six months or a year or two years from now. I, 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 I absolutely, go ahead. I'm sorry, could I respond to that question? Of course. Yeah, I, I take, your point is well taken. There's, of course, there's an enormous amount of uncertainty. I, there's always a challenge predicting in any economic moment. We know this is a particularly tumultuous one. Um, but I don't think it's a, a leap for an economist to take a look at things today and say uh, with some amount of confidence that we're in a recession that's going to be with us for a while uh, and the market's not going to suddenly get better. Um, and I guess all I'd say is, is the, the issue you've identified is the same issue that exists no matter when we decide to do the study. Uh, and if anything, there's probably greater certainty that something is not going to be uh, uh, viable financially for the next three years. I think you can more confidently say that today than in any other time in the last decade. I, Mayor, I absolutely agree with you. The uncertainty in the mm -hmm. real estate market, all real estate markets is uh, huge for the next few years. So ab absolutely, I agree. I agree with that. I do agree with uh, having a feasibility study that takes in all the city of San Jose because there are potential areas for development that uh, for high rises that m would be worth looking at midtown other areas in San Jose so I it, expanding the feasibility study to the whole city makes a lot of sense to me so I um, the oh, actually those were the questions were around the feasibility study and the timing uh, and Midtown and other areas, but those have all been answered so far. So thank you very much. Thank you. Councilman, do you have? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so we're, we're, as Jackie said, we were just basically moving forward with something we already debated. So uh, people can refer back to the video for my, my advocacy on this point. Uh, but I, 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 I am aware that we have a lot of people watching and, uh, recently, a lot of, uh, what, I guess, council heads, people who spend their days with us at council. And I, I think it's easy to get tripped up over this notion of feasibility studies. So just for the, the public's benefit, Nancy, could you 
explain to us what a feasibility and the importance of it is because we're doing commercial link industry in a few weeks and you know we're tossing this around a lot and what is what is the importance or, or significance of doing one of these studies so the thank you very much council member the feasibility study looks at uh costs including land costs project costs soft costs against what revenues, projected revenues, could be obtained and analysis of the returns that are likely, uh, including the costs of, of money uh, in order to determine can a high rise uh, uh, project be built. San Jose has, has struggled, as you well know, with a history of having high costs for construction. Costs for construction of a high rise are that much greater and our rents are lower than in other areas. And that's why high rise has not penciled generally uh, uh, in, in downtown. Uh, and the feasibility would look again at those issues, not only in the downtown, but outside the downtown. Now, now we don't just do this out of curiosity. There's a there's a legal significance to it, right? So, Councilmember Perales's question at the start was, you know, the timeline we have associated with this is kind of rushed now. It's, it's difficult to actually get things going because of COVID. And your response was, well, we have to remain precisely with it because that's what the feasibility study provided. Uh, so there is a, I feel, a significance to what we're doing here uh, with this. So if you could elaborate on that. Yes, that when when the council uh, worked to pass workforce standards, which apply to um, uh, certain projects and public projects uh, 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 in certain instances, there was the requirement that if private um, projects were given a subsidy, and a subsidy can be determined to be a, a decrease in the fees that a project pays, then the only way a project would not be subject to workforce standards if, if a feasibility was study was done for a whole class, like high-rise housing. And it wouldn't apply to one project, but would apply to a class of projects. And if it was found that the, the high-rise, for example, was not feasible, then the uh, workforce standards would not apply to the projects. Sure, thank well you, Nancy. Yes. Oh. No, finish your thought, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, that, that, was, that was what I meant to say, thank you. Okay. Well, in, in light of all that, and just kind of to reiterate that we're not doing this and we're not kind of picking the time to get the result we want, but I think there's a there's an underpinning significance to why we need these kind of studies, uh, especially in the context of high-rise residential right now. Uh, I, I would support the, the motion to, to proceed sooner rather than later and, and capture whatever data we can. And I'll yield with that, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Pross? Yeah, hey, thank you. Just uh, I wanted to clarify before we, we vote on this motion, because I'm comfortable with uh, exploring another feasibility study if, if there's obviously any extension to this. Um, my question is in regards to, to budgeting costs, especially if within the motion we're looking at you know, citywide here, um, what would be the proper way to, to move forward? And do we know even what that would cost at the moment? Um, based on prior studies, likely in the range of 75,000, because it's a broader jurisdiction, it may be closer to 100,000, but we would, we would have to make some inquiries to, to make sure we're in the ballpark. So then ultimately, I guess we would be giving direction here for you to come back to, to report back on what the budget implications would be rather than actually just give you direction to go forth and do this considering the, the, the dollar amount of it, or am I wrong on that? We could certainly come back and update the council on initial uh, responses in terms of both timing and costs. I, I would prefer that be the case. I just. I don't think it would be wise of us, especially in this pandemic, as uh, Councilmember Foley pointed out, um, we should be knowing how much this is going to cost before we just ultimately decide to go forward. So if that could be amended in the motion, uh, at least to allow us to, to hear back um, what the what the cost would be, um, then we can decide at that point. Uh, Councilmember uh, Camus, I believe there's a request for a friendly amendment. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm okay with that as long as we can come back 
fairly soon. I'd like to have it come back within my term. Is that possible? <laughs> I believe we can bring this back and the analysis of what would be the next steps to go forward uh, in a, um, anticipation of time and cost. And, and this is Jackie from the housing department. I, you know, because of the expansion of the scope of work, for us to really have a idea of the true costs, we would actually have to write the RP and send it out in order to better understand that. So it would take us some time to get those initial steps done, but I'm sure confident we could get that done before your term. How much did the last one cost? I believe it was 75,000. Jared, do you recall specifically? Uh, Chris might know. Yeah, sorry. It was uh, the cost on the last study was 60,000 with strategic economics. And I will just uh, point out uh, for council's reference that the ordinance restricts which consultants we can use uh, to do the analysis. There's a list of five consultants, I think, um, that we would have to check in with. And, and the that, last that, study was just in, in downtown, correct? Yeah, the, the prior study was just in downtown for high-rise development, that's correct. Okay, yeah, I'm okay with the, um, I'm okay with that amendment. Um, and and may, maybe I should raise my hand, Mayor, let me raise my hand. Um, I had a, another question for Nancy, but it's not my turn to speak. Actually, no one else spoke. Uh, unless Councilman Perales wanted to add anything. No, I, if uh, that's accepted, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Okay, Councilmember Camus. Nancy, is there any legal ways of, of removing these fees any faster? I mean, it, to me, can we remove the, fa the fees for now and, and then wait for another study? Because honestly, I don't even think that anybody's going to build, but can we remove them now and then see if anybody bites? I, I would turn to the city attorney for a, a response. In, maybe informally, but um, I, I've always thought that, you know, I've always said that, you know, we made these fees, you know, we, we actually mm -hmm. We decided on these fees uh, in a city council meeting. I don't understand why we have to even do a study to have them removed. Be because the removal of the fee is considered a subsidy. That's the. Per, per, and, yeah, and, 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 and no, I've, I've, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, and, and Nora, please help me, but I there is a state uh, is discussion yeah. which requires that anything over $100,000 of quote unquote subsidy, which decrease of fees does re require reporting. And based on our work uh, with community partners to establish the workforce standards in the process uh, that we've just gone through, uh, we, we would Im imagine we would understand that the, the same process would need to be followed in the next instance. Okay. That's correct. Um, okay, Councilman Council, you have anything further? No, no, I'm good, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, Nancy, on on the issue of cost, that's kind of where I was going with my question, which is, you know, we supplement EIRs and we don't do a whole new EIR uh, because there's some particular new bit of information we're seeking. But the basic construct of the study has been done. And, and, you know, there's not an enormous amount that's changed except the fact that nobody can get financing. Um, and there's probably no one to go rent anywhere near the same level of rents. So I'm just trying to figure out why couldn't we, you know, essentially go back to the same consultant and say, just update the study and do it at a discount. Mayor, we had asked the city attorney's office very similarly along those lines of thinking, two questions. Could we simply amend the date or was there an extension based on COVID? We asked both those right. questions. And uh, 
we, we, after thoughtful consideration, the city attorney's office uh, reviewed the workforce standard requirements for the feasibility study embedded and indicated that if there were significant changes of which the extension of time and the extension of jurisdiction would require a new feasibility study. We'll go back and double yeah, check I, that, Jinky. I, I could see that if those changes all pointed in different directions, but all the changes point in one direction, which is ain't nobody gonna build. So <laughs> just that's a, so anyway, I, I understand what you're saying. I just wanna be incredibly legalistic about it. We could say, well, yeah, every given day something changes, but the way that all the changes have gone, it's not making it more likely anyone's gonna build. So it seems to me it shouldn't be harder to do the study, it should be a lot easier. At least to the extent, I understand what you're saying, Mayor, that, that the, the new study could build on the study that we just relatively recently completed. Um, right. We will ask the question again to make sure we're, we're within uh, legal findings, but understood and would also like to streamline where we could. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilman Aranis? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just have a comment. Um, I'm not sure that having a feasibility study citywide is a good use of our staff resources. And so um, I'm wondering if maybe what we could do is, is um, target the areas and maybe align them to the, uh, the same areas as the commercial linkage fees because we know those are the areas that have more potential for growth. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that I can include that in the, in the motion as a friendly amendment. Well, I, we haven't passed anything with commercial linkage fees, so it's tough for me to say yes on something we haven't passed. Um, and I, and I, I'm willing to say, uh, to the demographic areas, uh, Council Member Camus, that were already presented to us uh, during um, the the uh, development cost study and uh, study session that we had previous to the uh, the commercial. Uh, I mean, the this discussion, and so those areas are, are targeted. It's, it's not based on a, approval. Um, these are the areas that were already identified by. Um, staff and, and the research that was done, and that's North San Jose, downtown West San Jose, and West Side. Well, look, I'm 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 not, you know, at, at the risk of of telling you how I'm going to vote next week. I I'm not in favor of even accepting the report on the linkage fee, so I can't necessarily accept this. Amendment. I am willing to narrow the focus of the research um, that we focus on areas that have uh, transportation corridors like rail, if that will save us money and time. Uh, anywhere near pu uh, public transportation is something that I'm willing to narrow the focus of the study by, and, and hopefully that'll help you, you uh, make that decision. Sure. Um, I just don't see the benefit of studying uh, this in, specifically in my district. I, I would see it's a it's a, a waste of time, a waste of resource. One, because our development policy is meant to restrict, um, and uh, and so it, it just wouldn't really make sense. And so I appreciate the the amendment um, to align to transit, I guess, corridor friendly areas. Um, it, it troubles me that we're thinking about um, having a feasibility study right now, and I, I have to agree with Council Member Foley that um, that this is this is probably not the best time. This is not the time to to have this kind of study because we're going to set it up for for development to come, um, and once economic uh situation changes we're gonna have to have another facility study and i am just gonna connect the dots here um 
because if we were providing the subsidy for these nine um, high rises during the best of times, and the feasibility to uh, study told us that it wasn't feasible to include a, um, a workforce uh, standards, then, um, then I'm going to project that this feasibility study is gonna have dire and very unfortunate um, results for uh, our working uh, families that um, that also need that level of protect that need protection in, in, in the former workforce standards um, so that they can keep the roof over their heads and not add to this homeless uh, population that we are battling and this housing crisis that we're all battling. Um, and so, uh, I guess if, if that's as far as you'll go, I don't know if, if I can support um, the motion on the floor. Um, it just, it seems like we're, we're setting ourselves up uh, to do more work later on and we're just kicking this can down the road. Thank well, you. well, Council Member uh, Irene, there's, a, sure. there's, there's not a whole lot of public transportation rail um, in your district. Um, and so I, I think most of it will be excluded. Uh, and, and I am looking out for the workforce. If there's nobody building, that means nobody's gonna have jobs. And we have to look at what we can do as a city council to spur job growth um, in, in bad times. We have a high unemployment rate and a lot of the jobs that come out of construction are skilled and good paying jobs. And that's why I am um, asking for this. Um, I'd, I'd rather reduce the fees today, quite frankly, without the study, because I know that a recession is coming and I want our people to have jobs and be able to uh, provide for their families. And, and this is the point of, of, of what I'm trying to make. And, and the benefit of having those jobs is, of course, we're going to be producing housing as well. So, Mayor? Uh, yes. I, do, I just want to make a distinction because um, um, a number of good points were raised, but, but hopefully in an effort to, to add to clarity, the economics around high-rise residential will be very different than high-rise commercial or even mid-rise commercial or low-rise com commercial. So, so in looking at that, there will be very few areas even outside of the downtown that like maybe the west side that could possibly work for a high rise residential. So it, it, if you would allow, um, staff can come back with that as part of our recommendation. Sure, I, I mean, I can only think of probably three areas of the city. It's probably Berryessa, Bart Station, North San Jose and the West San Carlos Stevens Creek Corridor, but maybe there's something else. I, I, if, if it also makes it easier, Nancy, um, I, I, I mainly want to focus on the occupancy timeline here, which I think is is the main thing that I wanted to fix. And, and the main thing that Council Member Perales wanted to fix was to, I mostly want to take a look at extending this timeline. Um, and and just to result. clarify, I'm sorry, Council Member, just to clarify one more thing, I think as Jared had pointed out, for those folks who are coming in in the next two years, they'll have to get their building permit, they'll have 36 months to construct. It's when you get to when they're charging, uh, when we're receiving 13 or 24 before you go back to the 49 and looking at is uh, as part of that analysis, should those timelines bump out for yes. construction? Yes, that, that's, that's the whole point is, you know, it, it, with a current timeline, no, nobody really has time to construct. If, if someone's yeah. in the pipeline now and ready to go, then, and they can get money, then there would be time. Yeah, I just want to, I, I appreciate Councilman Kansas's point because nobody can get money to, nobody's going to get financing to build right now. Uh, unless they self finance and that's a small number of billionaires. Um, so because nobody can finance anything now, the hope is that by providing some runway, as soon as financing opens again, as soon as the financial markets melt, 
enough for someone to go get a shovel on the ground. I'd hate to think at that moment, they'd be looking at a pro forma saying, "Uh oh, we can't get this done in time to meet the schedule the city has. And mm -hmm. so this is the only way, you know, we're going to be desperate for the next three years to try to get more people to work somehow or another, as we're looking at double digit unemployment for a long, long time. So I think this makes a lot of sense. We could do, a, I think, a fairly quick and very reliable study, <laughs> a very accurate study. Uh, that could show us what feasibility looks like by extending uh, to, to enable somebody to get a shovel in the ground when financing emerges. Anyway, uh, Councilmember Prowse, do you have your hand up again? Or is that from before? Okay, Councilmember Sparta? Yes, yeah, sorry, that was, that was from before. Hello? Yeah. Councilmember Sparta? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I uh, just really wanted to make a comment really quick. I, I appreciate all the comments. Um, and while I understand that short term market conditions with the economy the way it is now, um, things have changed since the last time we discussed this. Um, and uh, at the time we were looking at a loss of nearly $67 million in potential revenue, 57 million of which would have gone towards solving our housing crisis. And so I'm deeply concerned, oh gosh, um, I'm deeply concerned about the fact that we're facing an ever worsening housing crisis. And yet here we are on the cusp um, of moving forward on another giveaway to developers while working families and communities are out working multiple jobs, struggling with increasing rents and all while enduring the worst of this pandemic. And we hear so often about the need to use every tool in our toolbox to address the housing crisis. Well, this is an important tool that we're essentially saying we're not gonna use. Um, and according to last year's housing element report, we only met 13% of our RENA affordable housing goal while meeting 83% of our market rate housing goal. And so I just don't see how another giveaway is gonna help our increasing number of struggling families here in San Jose. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, I would just uh, add, I, I think uh, a lot has been made of that. I'm sorry, Councilmember Jimenez? Oh, me? Mayor, did you? I didn't quite hear you. Was Go ahead, Councilmember Jimenez. Yeah, oh, you're right. Thank on. you so much. Appreciate it. Sorry about that. Uh, well, I, I the, the comments by Councilmember as far as I really resonate with me, uh, you know, at a time where we don't have sufficient wage theft enforcement for our workers in this city and at a time when I don't expect any of the projects in this pipeline to have any local worker protections, I'm very troubled by the, the, the discontinued insistence to move forward some of these subsidies. The other thing that comes to mind for me is that it seems to me that we've been doing this for upwards close to 13 years, extending, expanding and acting these subsidies and, and that's happened during the course that our economy has been, been humming and now when it's not. And so I, I have trouble with this because honestly, I can't foresee a time in which developers aren't gonna say we need subsidies <laughs> um, and, and, that, and that troubles me. And so for me, I'm not gonna be supporting this. I didn't support it last time. I think uh, we, we, we've seen this show before um, and I'm really concerned that we're going down this road again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else like to speak? Okay. I, I would just add, I think Council Member Jimenez is right about one thing, which is we will see this show again if we ever want to build a high rise tower that's residential uh, in our city, given the construction costs. And given the challenges of building in a city with a with an airport that constr that constricts how high you can build, we're always going to have this challenge because this will be an incredibly hard place to build high rise for anybody to finance it. And we don't need a study to tell us that. We haven't had a single high rise breakdown since 2017, despite the fact that we've been in a red hot economy for a decade. And we can count the number of high rise residential towers that have been built in the entire city over that decade on one hand. It won't even get to the full hand. And we look at other cities like Seattle that at one time had 67 cranes in the air. You look at Portland 
look at LA, you look at cities up and down the West Coast, and you had very different cost structures, much greater ability to build high rise. And they could do it because they didn't have the same obstacles we've got. High water tables, low airport restrictions, and very, very high construction costs. In fact, the highest in the nation, if not, according to Wall Street Journal, in the world. So that's what we're grappling with. And yeah, we're going to continue to have to eliminate fees and costs if we ever want that to get built. And I don't believe, in fact, I know it's not a subsidy because the law says it's not a subsidy if it can't get built otherwise. That's exactly what the, uh, the worker uh, uh, provisions say in our ordinance. We're very clear about what a subsidy is. A subsidy is as if you cut a fee when someone would be able to build. The point of the cutting the fee is that somebody can't build. And so you got to get out of the way if you're going to get anything at all. So the $67 million number is nothing but a charade. And I've said it before, I'll say it again. You do not get a single dollar out of a builder from a fee if they cannot get financing to build or if they do not want to build. Just won't happen. You can have the fee as high as you want. You won't get a single dollar if someone says, sorry, can't get a loan. And we don't need studies to do it, show it, but we had two separate studies prove it in the last three years that nobody could build. And even if you didn't look at the studies, you could look at the skyline and come to the same conclusion. Nobody can build. So we can continue to pretend that this is a giveaway, as it's been called, or a subsidy, even though none of the evidence supports it, and the law clearly says it is not. To be clear, a subsidy is when you give out money or cut a fee for someone who can build, and it inures to their profit. The contrary situation, which is what we're doing, is cutting fees for those builders who cannot get financing or cannot build unless there's some reduction in cost. And we can continue to, to hope, but hope is not a strategy. I'd much rather do something about getting people back to work. Uh, Councilor Jimenez. Yeah, Mayor, I, I appreciate your comments. I, I think we, we all come from different perspectives and interpret some of the language a little differently. I think one of the things that I, I think just very, speaking very honestly, one of the things that I've consistently heard is, is that the construction costs are so high but likewise, I've also heard that a lot of these developers that are asking for these handouts refuse to come to the table and talk to the very people that are providing the labor to negotiate this sweet spot where, one, we can get jobs and they can get their projects built. And so it's challenging for me to believe that, uh, you know, the numbers just don't play out when some of these developers just aren't coming to the table to have these conversations. And, that, and that's what's frustrating to me, because uh, I hear time and time again from a lot of the different unions that do this great work on these buildings that are quite frankly the real reason these buildings reach up to the sky and, and, are, are, and are you know made of good construction, good quality work. Uh, I've heard time and again that the developers just simply aren't interested in coming to the table to figure out how to bang out a deal, <laughs> to use our president's uh, language, right? To, to, to make this work. Um, and, and so it's just frustrating, right? They come to the table asking for subsidies, hand, whatever we want to call them, right? Incentives. Um, but when it comes to doing right by their workers, um, it, it seems to me that many of them are not interested in doing so. Not all of them, but many of them are not interested in doing so. And they'd much rather go to the non-union contractors where they can pay people low wages, zero health care, <laughs> uh, uh, sort of uh, creating these very conditions that, 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 that caused us to have this fiasco at Silvery Towers some time back. And so I just, you know, I feel like we've just gone in circles for many, many years. You know, I remember when I was part of the uh, San Jose Parks Commission, the chair, and we wrote a letter tied to the reduction of fees. Like, that's how far back this has gone. And it, it's just, you know, I, I understand everything you're saying. And, and it's, you know, some of it makes sense. I understand. Things need to pencil out. I appreciate that. Uh, but if I, you know, I'm certainly not a developer, but if, if one of the challenges to building some of these things was the cost associated with labor, I would sit down and have a discussion and figure out what, how the heck we can make it work. And I don't think that's happening. And that's a frustrating part for me. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Jimenez, I do encourage you to have conversations with folks like Ted McMahon, uh, who, believe me, spend a lot of time on just exactly what you described. Um, and he'll tell you he can't build if we impose the fees. Uh, Councilman Rennes. 
Thank you. I, I just want to make a last comment about um, where we're at. And I, I think we're, um, even though we, um, we're going to be facing a, a huge eviction um, fallout here pretty soon, we're going to see the result of COVID um, in a really concrete way. Uh, we don't know how long it'll last. We don't know how quickly we will recover. Um, and in the meantime, to do this kind of work to me is time not, uh, with the limited resources that we have, I just don't think it's very wise. Um, I also happen not to agree with it, but I primarily, I think it's not a very wise uh, use of time because at this point, I'm gonna say that all of it is going to be found infeasible you know, off the top of my head, <laughs> for everything. We're, we're not in the best place in, in, in this economy, and even in the best times, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't make it pencil out, right? So there's a reason why, uh, but, but we're moving ahead because we know that, but we know that there is some potential for growth for San Jose. Tech, tech companies are, um, doing their businesses really different. They have accommodated folks to work from home. And so they don't, people are not necessarily commuting. Now they can uh, really work and live where they're at. Hopefully it is in San Jose instead of them spending tax dollars in another, in another county or another city, they're spending it here, right? And, um, and I know that the tech uh, com the tech uh, industry is going to change and it, and then the pendulum might swing our way because with COVID we have the space we have an opportunity to develop campuses with some distance and if people if that's priority uh, for folks um, because we're social beings and eventually we want to be um, next to each other working with one another to complement our work we're going to find um, whatever the industry wants to go, uh, we have an opportunity to, to make some of that growth happen here in San Jose. And so it, it, it's clear that um, we're not as, as dire as we think we are since commercial linkage fee is coming in next week. And to me, that's a sign that there's political will um, to have that discussion uh, as well as we believe that um, uh, that some of the businesses who are going to develop downtown want to keep each other accountable for the growth that's going to happen in their area and not that and, and for not one company to be completely responsible for the growth of, of that area. And so I think in the same in the same way, we want to make sure that we keep um, developers accountable to the workers that they're going to employ. And so the accountability has to work um, it, it has to be a full cycle. It has to be a full circle here. Um, it can't just be amongst each other. Um, and then we leave out the working families who make all of these things happen and, um, ultimately. And so I, I'm not going to support the motion on the floor. Um, although I appreciate, uh, council member Camus, um, you accepting some of my, the, the, refining uh, some of these places. I honestly just don't think it's a good um, expenditure of our, our staff uh, resources. And I just don't think it's gonna be useful in, in the future. Thank you. Councilor Diab. Yes, sir. Uh, so I, I just wanna uh, say that I, I hope that uh, Council Member Arenas's um, um, subscription pans out. I, I, I sincerely do. I, I, I feel though that uh, based on you know past experience and what we've seen, it is my belief, or, or for whatever reason, Santa is always on the, the the tail end of every economic boom, right? And then once things start slowing down, uh, we things cool off, right? When we, it, it, the boom were just to last another five, ten years, we would finally get a piece of it, and the development would happen where we're at, and shovels would come to the ground where we're at. But from what I've seen tech companies, employers want to be further up along the peninsula. They want to be near San Francisco. They want to be, you know, uh, in Mountain View and in Palo Alto. And there's these boom and bust cycles. And then when you start booming again, it's those places that start getting the attention. And then eventually they build out. There's no more uh, availability for development. And then they finally come to San Jose. And then, and then when they do, 
uh, the Great Recession happens or, or COVID happens. And now with COVID, I'm especially concerned because we don't know what the new normal is. And there's all this talk on Twitter and, and you know, in the tech blogosphere and stuff about people just leaving the Bay Area and, and living on a farm uh, and, and, you know, in the middle of Minnesota or somewhere and still and still working for tech because that's the new thing. Now you can do it remotely. You can work from far away. And we don't need necessarily to to be uh, collaborative and, and next to each other to accomplish what we used to do. I, I hope that's not the new normal because I still think that there's something special about Silicon Valley and all the uh, the collisions and the new ideas sparking. Uh, but th there is a very real chance that in this new normal, there is no need for tech campuses or no need for large employment uh, centers anymore. And people are dispersed, workforces are dispersed around the country. And that is not in San Jose's favor, uh, once again. So, so I think my... Uh, my concern or some of my colleagues' concerns in regard to this is not so much pitting developers or employers against workers. Uh, it is the way that our system is set up, the funding schemes of how the city of San Jose funds our services, parks, roads, police, fire, safety, all of that comes from uh, you know, the, the income and, and taxes on whatever else. So we need to keep that spigot running in order to capture the fees that we're all trying to get. Uh, and I think it's really just a matter of well, a difference in opinion on uh, how to keep that spigot running. Because if you, you, you bend too far in one way and you stop it, then well, there's nothing. There's no high rises and there's no jobs. Uh, so that's really just I want to share. And, and but I truly do hope that uh, what Councilmember Reynas predicts uh, plays out because I think that would be beneficial to San Jose. I'll yield. Councilmember Davis. Well, just one uh, note of hope, speaking from experience, uh, any tech workers who have moved to, say, uh, Minnesota or North Dakota may come back after their first winter there. So we do have weather going for us here. Thank you. We'll uh, make sure that gets on the, the promo video we do for our city. Uh, but very good point. Thanks, uh, Councilor Davis. Uh, OK, uh, let's vote on the motion from Councilmember Campbell. Jimenez? No. Rallis? Aye. Yep. Aye. Crosco? Crosco? I'll come back. Davis? Aye. Esparza? No. Arenas? No. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Locardo? Aye. I'm going back to Crosco. Yes, I'm here. No. Thank you. Seven four. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to return now to the items. 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, and 4.4. Let me call them all. We're going to call them together because we're going to hear them all together. Uh, we'll have uh, presentations, obviously, in, in sequence. And uh, I know various members of different departments are probably going to jump in at different throughout them, so it makes sense to pull them all together. Uh, we are going to hear public comment on all the items together. We'll come back to council. We can certainly discuss them together. I, I, I suspect there's going to be separate motions on some of these uh, as we break them out. But let's uh, go ahead and call them together. 4.1 is report on police misconduct complaints received during period of civil unrest. 4.2 is release of police department video clips related to recent protests. 4.3 is actions related to police reform and reimagining police and strengthening the investigative authority of the office of the IPA. Uh, the independent police auditor and uh, item 4.4 .4 is police department duty manual amendments. So starting with 4.1, I believe Siobhan will be presenting. Welcome Siobhan. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, let me see if I can pull up my screen here. Uh, let's see here. Okay. I'm not going to be pulling up my screen because uh, I'm at my home computer and I don't know how to do it from my home computer, but the report is pretty much, um, you know, straightforward. We received a tremendous number of complaints in a short amount of time. 
Um, and you can see that in our slide about the number of uh, concerns received. Over a thousand people contacted our office, um, phone, email, online complaints. Um, but of those um, many, many people who called to, com to make a complaint, we worked with internal affairs to narrow down um, the individual incidents. So we have 20 complaints that are moving forward through internal affairs that have to do with the police response to the, um, the demonstrations downtown. Um, so I just wanted to give council an overview that although we did get a tremendous amount of people calling, there are just 20 moving forward because many of them were duplicative. Um, many people complained about a particular officer. Many people complained about policies and procedures or the lack thereof. Um, and so again, moving forward, we have 20 complaints that are moving through the pipeline. And Siobhan, just to clarify, and if I could ask everybody to please mute their mics. Um, Siobhan, to clarify, when you say 20 complaints, you mean essentially 20 incidents about which there'll be in, uh, some review and investigation, uh, because obviously there were many, many more complaints, right? That's correct. There are, okay. there are 20 identified internal affairs complaints. Okay. And some of those incorporate multiple complaints. Multiple concerns, yeah. Yeah, And multiple okay. allegations. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, now, is there a any response from the police department on that item? Well, I, and Mayor, if I on? could, if I could jump in, I think so. I've got some comments. I'll just kind of provide on really all the items, and then I think Eddie will chime in. So we've kind of consolidated sure. our, our 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 comments here, just in the interest of time, and and so so that we can get to the public comment. Um, so certainly on on four point one, appreciate Siobhan's report. Um, you know, obviously that uh, there's investigations that need to continue, but I think the importance of, of Siobhan's report is it, it shows that we're capturing and hearing and, 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 and following through on, on all of the complaints um, that, that we have received. And, and it ensures that we will have thorough investigations on these complaints and, and that nothing really will be swept, swept under the rug. We will be following up on all these complaints. And that's what I think the importance of Siobhan's report is in a really Really appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chief Garcia and the police department on on pulling forward the the items on on 4.2 uh, and 4.4. Um, I think that's it's important that we were able to do that in in the time frame here, uh, so that we are responsive to what's been requested and really the community's interest in this and, and our interest in this. Um, and then when it comes to item 4.3, um, I just want to acknowledge, you know, a couple of memos there and particularly the memo uh, from, from some of you on the community gate engagement process and, and really appreciate the, the space here to be able to put together a, a coordinated community engagement process that, that allow us to really span the different work stream efforts that we have in front of us all the way from uh, the recruitment of the police chief, the, the, the use of uh, force review, and, and then reimagining uh, public safety. And, and so I do think what's laid out there it provides us that opportunity and certainly that opportunity to, to begin with the police chief recruitment and then hopefully have that new police chief involved in some of this community engagement work as we, as we work our way through it. Now, I will note that there's a, obviously a tremendous amount of work involved with with the overall police reform work plan that that we're we're putting together, um, and so um, you know it's going to take a lot for for us to be able to uh, you know one engage the community in a meaningful way, and then ever also to be able to keep up with with the work. Um, I, I will tell you that I've I've asked um, Jennifer, Assistant City Manager Jennifer McGuire, and Deputy uh, City Manager Angel Rios to really help lead. From the administration standpoint, this this body of work, of course, working with with our police department and and working with the, the new office of racial equity, um, so that we we are able to to manage it in a meaningful way. And, and as I mentioned, there's just a great deal of work involved with the with the police reform work plan, the community engagement that we want to do, and also the 
the engagement we want to do with our own workforce and, and communication with our own workforce. So um, wanted to lay that out for you. Um, uh, Jennifer and, and Angel are on today. And then I, I was going to ask Eddie, and I know he has his uh, many of his team members on today uh, to provide his perspective. Thank you, uh, City Manager. Uh, you know, I just uh, wanted to start just real quick, and I know as we go through this and talking about the reforms and those issues that m me and my team, we may have some comments, uh, but just moving forward, you know, we're, uh, we understand that we, uh, we need to, we need to uh, look at ourselves, uh, not just here locally, nationally. I think we all need to look at ourselves and see exactly how we can get better. Um, I truly believe that this department uh, has a spirit uh, to rise to the challenges ahead. Uh, one of the things that I think we need to keep in mind is also that uh, we want to ensure that these reforms uh, are also not only fair to our community, but fair to our rank and file and our police officers that are actually doing the work and also risking their lives. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I can't force a police officer to make an investigated car stop at three in the morning and get a loaded handgun uh, from a criminal in one of our neighborhoods. So as we go through this, I can guarantee you in the neighborhoods that I've spoken to, they want our police officers continuing to do that work and saying that we need to get better and saying that we need to be procedurally just, but also saying that that work needs to continue or not, too, or not mutually exclusive. And so those are some just main themes as we move forward that uh, I just want us all to keep in mind. Uh, but we obviously are uh, going to roll up our sleeves and do what we have to do to move this forward. And we appreciate the support that we've gotten. Thank you, Chief. Okay, uh, we're gonna go into public comment and uh, appreciate there's been a lot of public uh, engagement on this issue over the last several months. I, I just wanna offer a few thoughts and obviously we'll return to council discussion, but uh, I think it's important for, I'll, I'll just explain my own thing. I don't think anybody has to think this way, but I'll tell you how I think about this. That I think it's important for policymakers uh, to recognize the inherent complexity of every issue that we confront and that all too often as here, two things can be true. Uh, the two things can be first on one side, we've got a department where the overwhelming majority of the officers are incredibly hardworking, incredibly committed to the community and passionate about doing right by the community and serving the community. And they save lives every day. And they are committed to constitutional policing and they understand and appreciate the need for accountability. I also think on that same side of the ledger, uh, this is one of only 200 departments out of 12,000 in the entire country, less than 2% that have any kind of independent review over internal affairs investigations uh, in the form of, a, of an independent police auditor or any kind of uh, independent body that weighs in in any kind. Uh, and this is, a, a department that has consistently been on the forefront of a lot of progressive reforms, uh, particularly under this chief. Uh, on the other side, uh, I think the other thing that can also be true is that there are many members of our community who are very frustrated, uh, understandably and rightfully uh, outraged about what they may see in particular incidents in which officers have been involved. Uh, and we need to hear them. We need to see through the eyes of our community, and we need to appreciate deeply the need for reform. And I know that reform is a bad word for some because they believe strongly we should simply defund uh, either entirely or partially. And I know there's been lots of conversation about that, but that's not what we're gonna decide today. We're gonna decide what does a path of reform look like that includes the community and incorporates the community fully. Uh, and I think it's acknowledged in this notion of, of reimagining policing that there's an acceptance of one basic principle of of the defund movement. And uh, I've acknowledged it publicly that, uh, and I think many police officers uh, would acknowledge this as well, that there are some things our police department simply should not be doing. Uh, and that we could better respond to some concerns with a civilian, uh, particularly a non-criminal concern. And so uh, we've got the start of a lengthy community engagement process happening now. Uh, and obviously we'll hear from the public today, uh, but the more engaged uh, opportunity, the opportunity to really roll up our, our sleeves together is going to come in the months ahead. And particularly as we have a new chief on board who I know will also want to be part of that process. So I look forward to the road ahead. We've got a lot of work to do. 
uh, and it starts with hearing from the community. So first we'll go to Amani Kimzan. Uh, everybody will have a minute to speak and I'm sorry for the constraints, but we are trying to resolve an awful lot Mayor, before midnight. Mayor, can I, can I, can I just say something for the order? Uh, yes. Uh, you, you know, the, the lights out there are just being really thrown out of your streets, but I'm literally by and light. <laughs> uh, Councilor uh, Jimenez, uh, we're, we're not hearing you very clearly. Could you say that again? The light, the power is out in District 2. The lights are out in District 2. Yeah, Mayor. Yeah, he's out of power. <laughs> Mayor, I'm sorry to cut in. I got a I got a text as well from Lori Mitchell saying that 10,000 people are out of power in downtown in the Rose Garden. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Um, just I'm FYI. Ask, yeah. Let's hold off for yeah. just a moment here. My understanding of the rolling blackout uh, heat map was that uh, most of those folks were supposed to have been released by now. But uh, Dave, do you, do you guys have anybody who can give us more information? I don't know if Lori's on. Yeah, she she just sent me an email. So we do have a big chunk of downtown and beyond, I would say, that's out right now. Um, okay. Lori, are you on still? She probably is not. Um, Mayor, this is uh, Councilmember Perales. I, I got a message from uh, pg and &E Rep Daniel Cedeno that said that the 10,000 in downtown uh, is not related to the rolling blackouts. Yeah, it's an infrastructure problem. So, okay. so Councilman Mendez, I suspect that whatever is afflicting your power is also afflicting your audio. Uh, we're not able to hear you, but if, if you want to text me, that would be helpful. I'd be happy to repeat whatever you text me or text Tony or someone. Also, Mayor, just so you know, yeah. my my texts are, are taking quite some time to go through. So that yeah maybe impacting the mobile network as well. Yeah, understood. Okay. Um, so at this point, uh, let's see here. We have, I just got uh, something from the, from also from Daniel Cedeno with Council Member Perales reported major outage downtown. Okay. So uh, they're actually asking to speak with me. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask Vice Mayor Jones to step in. Um, let me just check in here with the council because obviously we want to make sure everybody can engage in the community. Uh, and obviously there's some communication challenges already with members of the council. Uh, so are there, uh, perhaps uh, Tony, can you do a roll call for everybody who can actually engage with us on the council right now and just to understand who's able to engage. Sure, Jimenez, we know can't. Perales? I'm, I'm here. Diep? Diep is here. Carrasco? Here. Davis? <laughs> here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Camus? Here. Jones? Here. Licardo. Uh, here. And Sergio also texted me and said that he's concerned about not being able to vote um, in his tablets at 28%. I see. Okay. Um, yeah, I appreciate the frustration, Councilor Jimenez. Uh, I'm also mindful, though, that there are, there are certainly votes in which we're all unable, for one way or reason or another, to be present. And I suspect this rolling blackout will activate again. I mean, we will have uh, power back on since we're at the tail end of the peak power usage. Um, so let me just ask the council, is there any objection if we proceed with public comment for now for all those members of the public who are able to comment? Uh, and then we'll reassess whether or not we move forward after public comment. Uh, obviously, it'll help if Councilmember Jimenez is able to join us at that point. Is that acceptable? Uh, let me just ask, is there anyone who objects to that? Councilmember Peralta, do you have your hand up? I, I don't object to that. That was actually going to be my suggestion that I was going to make, is that at least we can hear public comment. We have a number of people that want to speak now. 
and then yeah. maybe after public comment is done, we can reassess uh, where we're at and, and if we want to proceed. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, Vice Mayor Jones, if I could ask you to uh, to call members of the public, I'm going to get on the phone with PG and figure out what's going on. <laughs> All right. Uh, Thank you. And it, so for members of the public, uh, you have two minutes to speak on um, any of the items. I, I, I think that was one minute. Okay, we have it, we have it uh, on the screen. We have it two minutes. So, uh, so you have one minute to speak on um, any of the items 4.1 to 4.4. So the first speaker is uh, Marnie. If you could take yourself off mute. We can come back, Vice Mayor. Okay. V. Uh, Christie. I'm here. Um, thanks again for allowing me to quickly uh, just kind of relate my opinion on what's going on with uh, items 4.1 and 4.4. Um, I'm feeling a little rather redundant, uh, but I feel like it needs to be said. I feel like SJPD must be accountable and strict on who represents their department. If you want to be shown as examples, you must set the example first to maintain the best example. Obviously, Aurora and Minneapolis, Cleveland, who have failed beforehand. Um, you guys are also following suit by failing with our Hispanic community, and you also have failed with the woman who has assaulted by a police officer in a McDonald's parking lot. Um, to set the example, I would really like it if you guys would actually... Um, fire Jerry Run, who went viral on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and was caught showcasing unacceptable behavior other than that most other workplaces would call for an immediate re removal. Um, Police Chief Garcia, regarding this man's behavior as excusable by softening his behavior as being called a kid, while Tamir Rice, who was also shot by Cleveland police, was not granted the same grace. So those are my comments. So I wish I had a little bit more time than just a minute, um, but other than that, I hope you guys take my comments seriously. Thank you. Scott? Great. Uh, thank you, everybody. Scott Largent. Uh, moving forward, uh, you know, I think it would be better if we uh, shopped around and got a new chief in place uh, ASAP and not wait till the end of the year when um, Eddie Garcia retires. I think we need the new, um, the new big dog that comes from outside of the department. Um, we can work on reforms going forward. Um, we're beating a dead horse. Um, many of you know the situation that I've dealt with with Chief Garcia. Um, he's turned a blind eye to the community. He keeps stepping up to the plate right now, defending his officers, defending his rank and file. And um, why won't you release all these chess cameras? Um, I'm on San Jose Inside right now. I'm just filling the comment sections with all the fantastic footage I have. Because check it out, we want those cameras because that's gonna show the banter. It's gonna show the locker room talk. It's gonna show how these officers really feel about the American public, the homeless, the poor, um, just all the downtrodders in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Robert? Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry, this is all being reduced to one minute because uh, there's quite a bit that's being covered right now and to try to cover everything in one minute is difficult. The other thing is that um, it would, would have been nice if we had been able to have heard the reports prior to making comments, then we could comment on the report itself. Um, but I would say that right now, uh, one, I'm in favor of uh, increasing the powers of the independent police auditor. And I, you can never go too far with that. Uh, we need oversight over the police department. The uh, video clips need to be released uh, as soon as possible. I think the public has the right to that, to see what's been going on. Um, I think uh, reimagining the police department is something that we need to do. There's a lot of, like, like what the mayor was saying, there are a lot of jobs that the police are doing right now, especially non-criminal uh, type things that we need to rethink and have other people have the ability to respond to. Um, the duty manual, I think not only should it be updated and uh, uh, corrected with some of the contractors that we've been witness to, but also uh, it should be open to the public so that everybody would have an opportunity to be able to review that at any time. Um, and, uh, 
Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Nicole? Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Nicole Boaz, and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart, and I live in downtown San Jose, um, although my power is still on. Uh, after decades of broken promises and empty reforms, uh, black and brown communities continue to be the targets and victims of police violence, abuse, incarceration, as the budget for SJBD balloons at the expense of community programs. Um, we must address the urgent needs of San Jose's black and brown communities, and we're demanding that the city of San Jose defund the police and fully fund community services. Um, that's all I've got, so I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? Yeah, good evening, Council. Um, since 1852, since the, since the inception of the police department, its, its main policy was to terrorize the native populations. That was from the very beginning, okay? And ever since then, I have objectively looked at the department to see if there's been any behavior that is inconsistent with the, with the principles that organized it in the first place, which is to keep races that are not white under control, keep them under control. And the, the means of doing that is by uh, institutionalizing uh, certain behaviors, and you just you just see it. We can't we can't stay at a point to where we continue to play ignorant. We continue to play dumb. We continue to play like we don't see what's there. It's right there in front of us. So it's on us to just go ahead and deal with it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Karina. Hi, um, my name's Karina and my father was killed in San Jose. He was shot in the back in 2004. And I will tell you that the police use the same, um, the same tactics in the protest video that they put out. They try to criminalize the people that they are attacking in order to justify their actions. They're not taking any accountability. And if they do release any footage that needs to be analyzed, um, you guys need to hire somebody because they are they do have the ability to tamper with things. I mean, I did see it in my father's um, case, a lot of inconsistencies and a lot of, you know, stuff that was covered up. And I really think that the police are not showing any um, remorse or accountability. So I don't understand how they can say that they want change. It's been 14 years and it's been the same in San Jose. Thank you. Uh, a number that ends in 1801. 1801. Take yourself off mute. Okay, we'll come back. Um, Lauren? Good evening. My name is Lauren Renaud. I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart, and I live in District 6. After decades of broken promises and empty reforms, Black and brown communities continue to be targets and victims of police violence, abuse, incarceration, as the budget for SJPD balloons at the expense of community programs. This is not about particular incidents, as the mayor just said, but it's about wielding the police as a hammer and seeing everything as a nail. Police do not prevent crime. Economic equality, education quality, mental health services, homes address the actual issues that are underlying crimes. We must address the urgent needs of San Jose's black and brown communities. I strongly support DBUG's Protect Your People budget demands and, argue, and encourage you to defund the police and fully fund community services. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carly? Hi there. Hello. My name is, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. My name is Carly Peach, and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart. And um, after decades of broken promises and empty reforms, Black and brown communities continue to be the targets and the victims of police violence, abuse, and incarceration. 
as the budget for SJPD balloons at the expense of community programs, we must address the urgent needs of San Jose's black and brown communities. We are demanding that the city of San Jose defund the police and fully fund community services. Thanks so much. Thank you, Molly. Hello, my name is Molly McLeod. Regarding 4.1, defund the police because the misconduct complaints and the militarized violence directed toward residents like Derek Sanderlin, who was SJPD anti-bias trainer, shows that we need to treat racism as a public health crisis it is. On 4.2, I amplify the call of SVD bug in the Protect Your People budget to release all SJPD video clips of violence toward residents. Um, on 4.3, the proposed actions do not go far enough. Um, we support the, I support the accountability measures recommended by SVD bug. 4.4, Law enforcement gets more protections under the California Peace Officers Bill of Rights than any public servant. And the memorandum of understanding approved by the city council in June um, is uh, allows this process to stay, defund the police, cut the budget, use the monies in ways that make amends for generations of defunding red line neighborhoods. Thank you, Molly. Uh, Jen? Hi, my name is Jen Meyer. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. Hundreds of people shared their experiences with you over these last months, and frankly, over years now, of how the structures of policing lead to direct and ongoing harm and trauma. The misconduct complaints shared show that so-called progressive reforms that SJPD has already tried will not solve the problem. The proposed accountability measures here do not go far enough. Tiny tweaks like those proposed will not address the ways in which institutionalized racism has weaponized policing against communities of color, both historically and still today. What does democracy mean if our elected officials do not meaningfully change their policy decisions after such a public outcry? We are asking you to value the lives of our black and brown neighbors and make real change. We are demanding that San Jose divest from the criminal punishment system and invest in community services. We support the Protect Your People budget for Santa Clara County and ask you to take seriously the humane and equitable vision represented there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, phone number ending in 5140. Vice Mayor, if yes. I, got, I got a notification that the phone number ending 1801 who tried to speak earlier is now ready to speak. Can we go back to them? Yes, let's do it. I'll let them speak now. Thank you. Phone number ending 1801. Maybe not. I see they've unmuted, but maybe they're still having issues. Okay, well, we'll go back to them again. Um, phone number 5140. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Hello. We can hear you. Can you hear me? All yes. Right. Great. Sitting in a dark park here at the Rose Garden. Power out. Smoke up. Smoke everywhere. But uh, that's got nothing to do with San Jose PD. San Jose PD has had a problem for like the last 40 years. I mean, it's the smug, arrogant attitude. They just don't beat up on brown and black people, by the way. They, they do good on the white boys, too. Matter of fact, they think we're going to go along with them. I never do, okay? My last interaction was with park police. They grabbed my testicles and arrested me for having a beer in the park, okay? Uh, what else? Being walked out of neighborhood meetings by Captain Tabaldi because she didn't like my question. My car gets stolen, and it sits, it sits in front of someone's house for a month. They kept calling about an abandoned car took them a month to, to, to actually call me and tell me my car was found after the insurance already paid for it. Uh, hour, hour, uh, takes an hour for them to come out when someone's sleeping in a car, a bum sleeping in a car. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Jeremy. Thanks. So 
we always hear a lot of complaints and excuses from San Jose PD on you know, why, why they're not able to do their job. I'd like to call a few things out. The reason that we don't have a lot of officers is not because we can't recruit. The reason we have a lot of officers is, is be, we don't have a lot is it allows current officers to get overtime and make more money. So we should follow the money here and realize that we're spending more than we should for fewer officers than we should. The lack of accountability at SJPD is it, it's, it's actually like frightening. We should, we should not be asking to get video for one specific time. We should always get videos. And let's also not forget that there was a SJPD officer who recently embezzled $18 million. You guys aren't talking about the $18 million. You're not talking about the woman that got dragged and punched. And the only way that San Jose can make this better is vote differently in D4 and D6 this November. Thank you. Thank you. Lori? Hi. Um, so I'm calling about 4-1. Please. Um, first of all, I'm very, um, what can I say, disgusted with all the policymakers, all those in, in law enforcement who continue to say officers are good kids and um, three-time killer, you know, one of their cops, Mike Pena, having cops who have killed three people and then recently you see them beating up a woman in a hotel. We need to stop investing in them and we need to start investing in the children. What about the children that fatherless? We need to invest in them. The protect your people budget, you can't make decisions that are going to be effective and make good changes for, to protect our community unless you include those impacted that were having seats at that decision-making table because none of you know what it's going to take because you're not walking in our shoes. Walk in our shoes, maybe you'll understand, but that's what we're trying to prevent for another person to have to walk in our shoes. It is not fun. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Nancy Palmer Jones. Thank you. I'm, <clears throat> I'm with the beloved community team with PACT. I want to speak to each of these issues very briefly, uh, even though all of this needs to go so much further. On 4.1, I'm interested in what happens when the report is complete on the misconduct. The San Jose Police Department must emphasize de-escalation training over use of force, including the capacity to differentiate in the heat of the moment between destruction of property and actual harm being done to individuals. The, val the individual lives and community lives must be valued over property. For 4.2, the whole situation of the lack of release of these videos speaks to how important it is that the police not be investigating the police. Move that investigative power to the independent police investigator. Uh, we've been talking about the, the um, taking out of the duty manual, the use of rubber bullets and the carotid artery chokehold uh, for years. It is beyond time for that to happen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kim. Kim? Yes, this is Kim Guptilko, and I am a member of Surgeon Sacred Heart, and I live in D6. And I uh, wish I could say I was incredulous that the mayor and the council members have completely ignored um, a, a huge outpouring of support for defunding the police from uh, the entire community. But I'm not, because we're used to not being listened to. and. Um, and I'm white, so uh, I can't even feature how black and brown people feel about this. Um, they continue to be the targets and victims of police abuse and violence and incarceration. And um, this budget for SJPD keeps going up at the expense of our community programs. We absolutely have to address the urgent needs of San Jose's black and brown communities. And we demand that the San Jose um, defund that the city of San Jose defund the police and fully fund community services. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Vita. Hello, my name is Vita Grossman, and I am a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. After decades of broken promises and empty reforms, black and brown communities continue to be targets and victims of police violence, abuse, and incarceration as the budget for SJPD balloons at the expense of community programs. We must address the urgent needs of San Jose's black and brown communities. 
We are demanding that the city of San Jose defund the police and fully fund community services. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Good evening. My name is Anna Zeiger and I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. After decades of broken promises and empty reforms, black and brown communities continue to be the targets and victims of police violence, abuse, incarceration, as the budget for SJPD balloons at the expense of community programs. We must address the urgent needs of San Jose's black and brown communities. We show up in support of the Protect Your People budget. We're demanding that the city of San Jose defund the police and fully fund community services meeting needs, not criminalizing them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Blair? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Um, it's my feelings that uh, Heather Randall uh, may have the street smart, street cred, and the metal needed in decision making but shouldn't San Jose be looking for a police chief that offers an important idealism? I would think Anthony Mata and perhaps Alan Washburn are examples, uh, are the examples San Jose should be looking for for the future of a police chief. Um, you know, we worked on uh, use of force issues and DOJ use of force uh, ideas uh, from 2016. Uh, that, that was from a very conservative uh, standpoint. And we're at a time we can really develop those concepts, uh, you know, in the progressive ways they're originally written and intended to be. And um, I, this is an issue that just is going to be needing a lot of talk and dialogue. And I, I'm hopeful that we're all going to be able to want to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Hi, Leslie Zeiger here. I'm a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. After decades of broken promises and empty reforms, black and brown communities continue to be the targets and victims of police violence, abuse, and incarceration. As the budget for SJPD balloons at the expense of community programs, we must address the urgent needs of San Jose's black and brown communities. We are demanding that the city of San Jose defund the police and fully fund community services. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, number that ends in 7912. Hi, uh, yes. I like to say it's crazy that nobody at the city can fire cops who are obviously causing problems and creating community outrage. I also think it's crazy that you guys are, don't want to ban tear gas and explosive devices in crowd settings, even though these weapons cause much more collateral damage and are more likely to affect many innocent, innocent people and deter them from expressing their First Amendment rights. Please at least make sure that the writing of the law bans foam batons and any other kind of description of these types of projectiles. I also want to call out everybody at the council, especially the mayor and especially Officer Perales, who stayed silent when news came out about the police officers union who was defending their racist officers and their bigoted Facebook posts. Uh, shoot. Uh, it doesn't seem like any of you guys really seem to be get what everyone is telling you or you just don't seem to care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Michelle Coleman. I live in District 6, and I am a member of Surge at Sacred Heart. <clears throat> After decades of broken promises and empty reforms, Black and Brown communities continue to be the targets and victims of police violence, abuse, incarceration, as the budget for the San Jose Police Department balloons at the expense of community programs we must address the urgent need of San Jose's black and brown communities. We are demanding that the city of San Jose defund the police and fully fund community services. Thank you. Thank you. Michi? Hi, 
Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. thank you. In reviewing the public footage, police investigators have put together from the public protests, it has been edited to make police look better than they are. I too have viewed footage from the San Jose protests that tells a very different story. I have seen footage of police beating people with wooden bats and shooting people with rubber coated steel bullets. I have witnessed war crimes as San Jose police used tear gas on protesters. I have witnessed San Jose police agitating peaceful protesters and escalating violence. This is why police must not have the power to investigate themselves. They will absolutely be biased in their own favor. The IPA must have the power to investigate police and body camera footage worn by police during the protests is in the public interest and must be made available for the public to view. Thank you. Thank you. Lori? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Lori Patcher. I'm a resident of District 6 in San Jose. And I would like to refer back to a letter that each of you council members received on June 9th from Silicon Valley Debug and was co-signed by over 30 organizations asking you to divest from police and invest in our community. I have read and I agree with each ask in that letter. It includes actionable steps towards public safety and well-being for all residents of San Jose. Reforms of a policing system that was formed to um, keep our non-white citizens uh, as targets and continues to target black and brown communities, continues to uh, target them with violence and abuse and incarceration is not a way forward. We ask that you address our black and brown communities needs and we ask the city of San Jose to defund the police and fully fund community. Thank you. Uh, Kristen. Hi, my name is Kristen Suko and I'm a resident of San Jose. Um, I think it's ridiculous that you guys aren't even open to discussing anything other than meaningless reforms. So first of all, the, the police cannot be reformed. They were born out of an institution that objectified and brutalized um, black people and indigenous people um, for the gain of capitalist economy. Um, so the only way is to defund the police and take away their power. So, and this can be done um, it doesn't all have to be done at once. It could be done step by step. So first of all, you need to fire any officer who uses excessive use of force, kills anybody, or has any racist tendencies. You can do things like that now um, in the goal to eventually defunding them. Thank you. Uh, Victor? Good evening. Um, I'm here to also reinforce the community efforts um, to defund the police. You know, we know that we have a, a be, not a behavioral problem, but actual racist institutional problem that's impacting the lives of black and brown people in San Jose and all residents at this point. The city's continual funding um, of the police force has, you know, today is a sign that, you know, you are here to ignore us and, you know, Today, we're not asking for reforms. We know that any reforms to enhance the IPA office will be will not be enough because you're not gonna provide independent prosecution power to them to actually charge the institution or their officers. We know that. It's not enough at this point. The history of this, this uh, San Jose has asked for this in the past and it's time for you to think about actually taking the, the weapons, uh, the funding that uh, enhances their power and racism against us, defund the police. Thank you, Victor. Um, number that ends 4379. 
Um, we've continued to see SJPD land in the news. SJPD is dragging their feet on releasing videos, and we're still here only talking about reforms. I'd like to see real efforts to defund the police. In the meantime, I'm grateful to see that the council has realized it's important that the community participates in selecting the next chief. Chief Garcia was quoted as saying he hopes the next chief is internal, and I urge the council to hit the reset button and conduct a nationwide search. This department has lost the public's trust, and an internal candidate is not what we need. We had early times in 2015 when uh, PD brass emails went public with the top cops laughing at crime and city rules and Chief Garcia joined in on the fun. With that said, I reiterate that the city ne needs to make real efforts to defunding the department. These reforms are not enough. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine? Um, good evening. Sorry, good evening, Council. Um, I'm Catherine Hedges, a district three resident and um, I've been listening to some of the comments and I agree that uh, police departments are just inherently a racist institution and all, all, all this tinkering with it is not going to make it not a racist institution. It's like if you have a pickup truck, you can, you know, decorate it and put light kits on it and stuff, but it's never going to be a sports car, it's a pickup truck. Um, we need to start over with a new institution and San Jose can pave the way for um, the rest of the country in just reimagining police. And I'm so disappointed that you haven't listened to all the requests from the public to defund the police. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. She already spoke, Vice Mayor. Okay. Um, Sheila. Hi, um, Vice Mayor of Chappie Jones. This is Sheila um, from downtown, and I'm a part of PAC's beloved community. Um, I want to reiterate what um, fellow locals have said about the SJPT. Um, over a thousand IPA complaints show that SJPD is broken. After George Floyd's murder, locals protested, um, and SJPD still hasn't been held accountable for racist and excessive use of force in downtown on um, our protesters. IPA needs an increase in power um, via point four two, um, and the police cannot police themselves. SJPD needs to release the videos and it needs to prioritize building public trust and being transparent and accountable. Um, on, via um, point four three, um, to reimagine safety uh, with racial equality, we also need to look beyond Dr. Woods and um, look to local justice leaders as well. And then hiring a new police chief, um, we need to look to impacted families and people of color and people of the um, LGB, TQ community as well. Thank you, sorry. Thank you, Sheila. Um, Moto G. Moto G, take yourself off mute. Hi, um, I think that Eddie should uh, have his face shown during this conversation, like face the public, face the music, face the uh, crimes of your people. Um, I think that uh, we as a community are disappointed, the victims of SJPD and the victims of elected officials with no political will. Um, we are just collateral damage. We are damaged, the collateral damage of campaigns, of resources, of people who are not willing to make tough decisions and stand up and protect the community for real, not just in words and not in just soliloquies that get a lot of like uh, shows on Facebook and Instagram, but stand up for us now and force SJPD to fund them, reform them, make this chief go away in disgrace that he deserves. And some of you elected officials deserve that same disgrace, but protect your community for real because we're suffering. Thank you. Uh, Dana? 
Reverend Dana Bainbridge, a pastor of Urban Sanctuary. While I appreciate many police who have very challenging work to do, I so often wish that when there are conflicts related to the poverty that's placed people out on the streets, that I have someone else to call. As an urban pastor who desires to address the complexity of poverty and mental illness and our streets with compassion, I often call the police because I don't have any other option when immediate help is needed. Police come and then they shuffle around and look frustrated for having to deal with one more call related to homelessness. You know, as we try to address the situation at hand, we have no options to offer really to deal with the situation. And nearly all homeless people ended up being criminalized because that's who gets called. This learned helplessness of the police in such situations is not their fault as much as it is the misallocation of resources. So I wanna ask those doing the public listening process to reimagine public safety, to do so with a deep investment in finding ways to reallocate resources to mental health, recovery and racial justice. We need resources that really address the situations where we, you, we pick up Thank the phone. All right, we're closing uh, public comments and bringing it back to council. And I see the mayor is back, so I'm going to hand it back over to the mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor, and thanks to all the members of the community who came to speak. All right, let's um, turn to the council now. Uh, unless uh, Dave, was there any more presentation that we missed? I believe that's it. Is that right? No, that's it, uh, Mayor. We're, we're we're complete. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, all right then. Uh, to the council, anyone like to speak? Let me uh, suggest to make it easier. Perhaps we can take these in bite-sized pieces. Uh, certainly, we have a report first, four point one, on police misconduct complaints. Uh, and perhaps we could uh, just resolve that with a simple motion, unless anyone had any comments. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. On 4.1 then, are there any comments? Uh, Council Member Esparza? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had a, a couple of questions. Um, so how many department initiated investigations were initiated in comparison to IA complaints? I can, as Dave Knopf, Assistant Chief, I can answer that for you. We had uh, four, we had five department initiated complaints during that time period. Um, not including the officer-involved shooting that uh, also is a department-initiated investigation. Okay, and then um, the IA investigations, how many are those? I didn't see an exact number. We currently have uh, a total with the department initiated investigations of 24. Okay, and then um, I had a question about the body worn camera footage. Um, my understanding is that's an ongoing process, right? So will, will we get a report on that um, in the final after action report, when can we expect to get some of that information? Are you talking about the body worn camera footage that we currently have associated with all these complaints? Yeah, yeah, Spars, could, could, could we take that up right after, right after this one? I was hoping that perhaps we could get a couple of easy ones out of the way and then we'll focus on 4.2 next. Okay. That's fine. I mean, it's included here, but that's. Um, I, I guess we then, can take it uh, together if, if you like, but I think there's going to probably want to be a different motion. <laughs> Literally, in the pocket, I just had a, a question, so we can take it in the next item. Okay. Um, and then uh, I had a question on uh, for Siobhan. So 
um, if she's still on. So yes, we're going to get more specifics in the IPA annual report. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what we can expect in that annual report, and then um, confirm when that will be coming to council? So our, our 2019 annual report should be coming to council soon. We had some uh, delays caused by COVID and, and lack of staff. But in terms of following up with the complaints received in 2020, some of them will be reflected in our 2010, 2020 annual report. Generally, that goes to council in um, May. I'm hoping we can keep on track. Um, that report will talk about the complaints that have been closed. Complaints that are closed will have additional detail about what allegations were investigated and the findings on those investigations. It may also include some recommendations we might have that arise out of the investigation of those complaints. Wait, so am I right in hearing May? We have to wait till May? I thought we were going to get a report in September. So complaints received in the complaints received in um, May June of 2019 probably won't be resolved and able to report out until that time, unless the council would like to have a specific ta uh, tailored report uh, following up on this initial report. And what would that take? Well, to a certain extent, um, a lot of it involves timing. Um, as I mentioned in the memo, police misconduct complaints generally need to be resolved within a one year time span. But that, that time frame can be expanded or put on a tolling period if, um, if the case is especially difficult or if there's litigation filed. Um, and I think someone mentioned uh, sometime during this council meeting that there has been several um, litigation matters filed on the police um, response to the demonstrations. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if they will then impact some of these individual complaints. So for example, um, there was a significant number of complaints that we received after the Trump um, demonstration uh, of some years ago, those complaints are just wrapping up now because the litigation has settled. Okay, I understand. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and then I had a question. Um, so um, have you had a chance to review under policy complaints? Um, the fact that people were dropped off in Milpitas in the middle of the night? We did not get a complaint about that fact situation in our office. So we have not opened a complaint on that. We don't have the ability to self-generate complaints and we didn't get a complaint regarding that fact situation. And in this situation, it was the county sheriff who did that? What, um, would you then do an inquiry with the sheriff's office? How would that investigation progress? Would it just die because it wasn't SJPD? So my office only has jurisdiction over SJPD and we only are able to um, investigate complaints filed by members of the public. And since neither of those occurred, um, we don't have any part in looking into that matter. Um, if somebody wants to make a complaint, they can, um, Complaint to the Eternal Affairs Division of the Sheriff's Office. Okay, um, I and a couple of council members have actually requested some information from the Sheriff's Office. Um, so we will continue to follow up on that. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on 4.1. I'm having a hard time seeing other. Oh, yes. Uh, Councilman Rennes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so my question is around um, 
is, amount, is around uh, some of the IPA recommendations um, on the duty manual changes um, regarding the policy complaints. Um, could, could I ask you to hold off on the duty manual changes because those will come up. Right now we're just on the police misconduct complaints. Well, it's connected to the, the police conduct uh, complaints because okay. you could, um, Siobhan, you could make some duty manual changes based on some of these uh, some of the uh, some of the complaints you've received, and then um, through your and then through your investigation, uh, your findings, or, um, figure out if there's any um, duty manual changes that that could be relevant. Is that something that you're going to consider as part of this process? Sure, just as with any other complaint um, or clusters of complaints, um, when the investigation is finished, we our main duty is to make sure the investigation was fair, thorough, and complete. And in doing so, we will be looking at the applicable duty manual sections. That review might reveal that changes should be made to the duty manual sections, and then we would make a recommendation. But at this point, um, these complaints are pretty um, pretty new. They um, I don't know where they are in terms of completing an investigation, um, and until they do so, any any recommendations will be premature. Got it. Um, and that end of year report, I heard you uh, uh, explain uh, the timeline with uh, Councilmember Esparza. So uh, thank you. Um, I also have, well, let me ask you for, um, I know we've received policy changes or duty manual uh, uh, recommendations in the past. Is there, at this point, be a question for the lawyers, is there, uh, could we reconsider some of the previous um, duty manual changes that have maybe not been accepted in the past and maybe they come into play now? We, uh, well, that might depend on what they are and whether or not it was properly noticed for the uh, community. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, uh, I'm specifically thinking about, um, I think it was in 2017 or 2018. It's a time warp now, Nora, <laughs> but um, there was some uh, recommendations for around domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, and so I think we, we should uh, maybe take a look at that once again. Um, it, you know, I don't know whether it'll move forward, but I would like to have a, a reconsideration of those. Um, so I was uh, wondering if that was technically possible. Um, I don't think that's part of um, what's what's been noticed um, for this evening. So that could be brought forward, but I don't think it's it's noticed for this evening. I'm trying to look here. And, well, we we can take this offline, Laura. Um, mm -hmm. And, and figure it out, figure it out offline. Um, the, the, other, the other question I had, Siobhan, was, I know we heard, you know, hours and hours of, of public comment, and as you can um, hear tonight, you know, we, we have some folks continue to um, call in and uh, reflect their concerns. And so did we, um, I wonder if residents might have thought that incorporating their comments or having public comment was a form of submitting a complaint to us per se i know there was some facilitation on a uh, uh, website um, submission of, of complaints um, but i wonder if if uh, you considered uh, maybe a compilation of what you heard here on public comment as as something valid that was feedback from our community. I think it's a good point, but um, to a certain extent, our, our office has um, has considered complaints, those that come through the a, a more formal process where somebody calls us and they say, I have a concern. Um, but to, to make every um, comment that the public makes at, at, at a public hearing would be uh, number one, exceedingly challenging, and and then number two, then then people get follow up about 
maybe a you know a follow-up call from us maybe internal affairs then wants to speak with them and they weren't necessarily prepared to to enter into that complaint stream um but it is a good point i mean maybe we could um maybe we could work on making sure that people don't believe that making that that are not that don't don't have a misapprehension that making a complaint uh at, at public comment means that they that the uh, complaint a formal complaint is not started uh, would, I, we would have to think about that yeah i appreciate that because i think that it would be important to to maybe um as a disclaimer start our conversations this way um i've heard a couple of um uh, public comments um with folks who are frustrated and said we we've said this to you before why aren't you listening um, and so it makes me believe that they might have interpreted a, a previous public comment as a, an official submission of a complaint. It, um, and I hope that there could be some acknowledgement, maybe of a theme of, of public comment. I'm not sure exactly how, how that could work out, but um, it, it would be great to either um, delineate what that formal public process is during public comment when it has to do with these kinds of issues and they have a, but they know that there is another path forward, that there is something that they can do um, and that they're not under the impression that by simply um, having public comment that they have submitted a complaint per se. Uh, and I, I appreciate the consideration you're giving it. But I also think that it's something that we need to also address as a council and maybe have a disclaimer and, or on the on the screen somehow say um, post it post how uh, people can actually file a complaint if they indeed have one uh, versus believing that their complaints uh, or their uh, concerns within a one minute or two minute uh, public comment is deemed as, as filing. Yeah, so I will follow up with um, maybe first with with Tony to see if there's some process and then maybe um, and maybe then circle back with the city manager. I, I appreciate that Siobhan and those were my questions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, you know, just on Councilmember Rennes' point, Siobhan, perhaps for the 39 members of the community who are with us and as well as the those who are watching on on TV. Could you just tell folks uh, how they can make a complaint either by phone or online? Sure, so um, you can call our office. Um, it's 408-794-6226. Someone will get on the phone with you and take your contact information. And then one of our analysts will phone you back for um, an interview. We also have a complaint form that's attached to our website. You can search for San Jose Independent Police Auditor you'll see a big green circle. It's pretty easy to complete the form. Um, you can email us at ipa.sanjose, uh, sanjoseca at gov. And um, I think I, that's ipa at sanjoseca.gov. Oh yeah. Is Thanks. that right? Thanks. Yeah. I do that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'd give you the fax number, but I don't know off the top of my head. That's okay. I think that's that's probably pretty good. Okay, thank you. And uh, of course, uh, to be clear, the independent police auditor does not report to the police chief. Uh, they report to the council, so they are independent of of uh, the police department in any way. Um, all right. Uh, any other questions before we vote on four point one? Okay. Uh, let's vote. Clicking share, okay, I was clicking share screen and nothing was working. Um, Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Ms. Barza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Chemis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Uh, I'll just provide a quick update since I was out on the call with PG&E. Um, the problem appears to be located at the substation, PG&E substation, which is downtown. It's affecting many parts of western uh, San Jose, the Alameda, Rose Garden, Bascom, as Councilor Davis undoubtedly knows, 
already. Uh, we thought that the outages were primarily in the downtown, but they're not. Uh, it looks like most of the downtown remains on, although there are some buildings that are out, uh, including some county facilities, uh, and they're working on it and we'll hopefully provide an update soon. Okay, on to uh, 4.2, the release of police department video clips related to recent protests. <clears throat> uh, we'll go to a council comment unless the chief or Dave have anything to offer? No, nope. okay. Maybe I'll just start off. Question? Oh, go ahead, yes. Ask the comment? Uh, yes. I'm sorry? Are we giving the public another comment on each one? No, we, we, we are taking comment collectively. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was just taking the motion separately because I know it would be difficult making motions on four items all at once. So I thought it might be helpful to at least have a, a coherent dialogue among us. Uh, Councilmember Peralz. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. And, uh, now that my son's asleep, um, can come on here. Uh, he's not running around. Um, so my question here is really for uh, the chief or from the police department um, to to understand when it is that we think we will be able to to see some of the uh, body worn camera footage or the the um, helicopter footage. Certainly, that was uh, the intent, right from um, myself and, and I believe Mayor yourself and the others that uh, issued the first memorandum uh, was to be able to, to, to have some transparency on the, the videos that um, that were, you know, not necessarily just the ones that, that anybody can gather from the media. Uh, I think it's helpful that we have shared the ones from City Hall um, and recognize the constraints on ongoing investigations and litigation. Uh, so really, I think now it's just a matter of timing. And so I wanted to see if we can get an indication on uh, timing. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Dave Knopf again. So um, as we indicated in the memo that was previously issued for the August 4th uh, Council meeting, we have released the public video. Now regarding the body-worn camera video and the helicopter video, all of that video um, is number one, well, it's being, it's part of their current internal investigations and or city litigation. So, um, and then if there was any video that fell under 1421, uh, which not all of it does, but if it did, then it would be subject to release at the conclusion of those investigations. And, and do you have any indication of, of timing on what we might expect for um, these investigations, maybe based on um, historical uh, sort of data on, on that? Um, well, like, as you're well aware, we have a year to complete them. Um, some of those might take longer if it's uh, either a criminal investigation that's involved once that's concluded, then the, the administrative investigation would start, or if it's civil litigation, that the the, uh, in, the administrative investigation is also told at that point. So um, I know it's a priority for us to get these done, these 24, 25 investigations. Um, but based on you know past practice and the way we've handled these investigations before. Um, it's just kind of a timing thing. Council member, if, if I can add just as well, this is Eddie Garcia. Um, sometimes also um, things things bubble up that we need to, need to investigate and put on the front burner. Um, there's been some events that have occurred after the protests that we've had to put at the, on the, at the front of the line uh, that we feel uh, have a lot uh, of importance as well. So that also adds to the caseload of internal affairs. So I guess the best answer then is, is we we don't, other than the one year time frame, um, there's not a better indication of, of time um, that can be given. And uh, we, we might be able to see some uh, of these videos before that if an if a investigation is complete, but the likelihood is we'd probably be pressing closer up against the one year time frame. And then 
if there's anything with ongoing litigation, uh, Dave, you were saying that then that could even take longer, correct? Just in summary. Uh, that's possible, council member, but what I'll say is very, very, I mean, I, I don't want to say seldom, but we don't like our cases to take a year to investigate. Uh, obviously, particularly ones where the IPA has an opportunity uh, to provide input. And if there's issues that her and I don't agree with, then it goes to the city manager and that takes some time. So we very seldom want to take an entire year, but that is what the statute indicates. So that's what we don't uh, obviously want to uh, give any false hope that things are going to be done quicker uh, than, than what, the, what the process says. But we certainly want these cases done as quickly as possible and get them adjudicated. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to ask the, the question, why not? Um, and I know that I, like I've been somehow or another working around near and with cops for uh, about two decades. And I'm familiar with all the reasons why when investigation's pending, you don't mess with the investigation. You don't try to influence anybody. You don't try to affect witnesses. You don't get in the middle of it. You don't let politicians get in the middle of it. But with something of such considerable public interest where you have iPhones capturing images from all angles anyway, what is the harm in releasing video of incidents involving protests? And let me just add to that. What we see on social media typically are five or 10 second clips that show an officer perhaps using force, for example, and omitting all of the information that would be relevant to lead one to understand why an officer is using force and to understand whether or not that use of force was proper, lawful, or excessive. Uh, and so you never see what happened before when these clips are on social media. Uh, you only get the worst of it. And as a result, the public gets the worst possible impression. They never get to see the picture, the whole picture. Uh, until many months after the fact, if it ever gets released. And by that point, nobody cares anymore because the moment of, that's relevant for transparency's sake and for accountability is actually when the public is focused on the issue. And I, I can say personally, I saw overhead video in one case, uh, one of these incidents, in fact, one that we specified in our memo where um, many were accusing a police officer of attempting to actually run into um, a fleeing protester. And from one video camera angle, it actually looked worrisome in that, ex to that extent. And then I was shown subsequently an overhead uh, view of that precise incident. And what you actually see is the protesters fleeing is running right out into the road where the officers riding the motorcycle and obviously trying to avoid them. And you don't understand that until you see the overhead. And and so it was provided to me. So I put it on Twitter to say, hey, guys, here's, here's the contrary evidence so people can at least see the whole picture. And so that was a video I was asked about on NPR and a whole bunch of other radio stations. Hey, what's going on here? And because I didn't have that overhead video at the time, I think I, I did and I, I referred to it, but obviously the, the media didn't have it. They're only seeing one side of this. And so I guess where I'm going with this is, why not? Why shouldn't we just release video if we know it's an issue of intense public concern and there's already ample public video out there anyway? Why wouldn't we want folks to understand what really happened? Mayor, that's a good, really good question. And uh, I'm just to make a, a few comments and hopefully uh, Nora will chime in here uh, in a minute. But I think it's just a, it's a matter of we've had these discussions, the city manager, ourselves and the city attorney's office have had these discussions. I think it's about coming up with a process, a consistent process, uh, because it's not just about protests. It could be about any incident uh, that that we capture. And so, um, you know, not only is uh, fairness for the officer uh, as we go into this investigation, but also any possible exposure that the city may have uh, civilly as well goes into the decisions of making these investigations uh, as uh, you know, uh, you know, as, as succinct as possible without putting out unnecessary information. Um, 
And, and I think uh, one of the things we've discussed is about having a process to do things such, such as that, because to your point, yes, there have been times where there have been small clips of five seconds of force that's been used when we've gone back to see the body one camera and there's 30 seconds that aren't seen of the individual fighting an officer. Uh, and so to your point, uh, I understand your point. I think we need to work on a consistent process uh, you know, to be able to do those, did those type of things. Uh, but, you know, surely, uh, we're just, we're simply just trying to make it, ensure that we have a consistent process in place, uh, all across the board. So I, I appreciate the need for a straightforward process. And I also appreciate you guys have a real, uh, issue with regard to staffing, uh, because I know you had to quadruple your staffing, in the public record act request unit, uh, just to deal with the Bay Area News Group request, which I know is still underway uh, because it's, it's extensive. Um, and I just like to throw out a suggestion about a starting point. Um, AB 748 is already law in the state of California. Um, it became law, I think, in 2017. And that requires within 45 days of a public record act request that any visual audio visual recordings since primarily obviously body worn cameras that they're referring to of quote unquote critical incidents um, would be released and critical incidents are defined as discharge of a firearm by law enforcement or in death or great bodily injury to a person from the use of force by law enforcement now it also contains some exceptions uh, limited exceptions and that's where for example disclosure would um, would substantially interfere with ongoing investigation. So it's not just the fact that there's investigation going on, it's endangering a witness, uh, endangering confidential sources, safety, uh, things of that nature. And we also know obviously there may be privacy rights that you would have to blur out the image of some private individual. But it creates a basic process that we have to follow in critical incidents anyway, if there's a Public Record Act request. And I guess where I'm going here, and I know it's dangerous to be thinking out loud, I'm not expecting everyone to have the answer. But as you can tell, you know, I, I, I've been challenging this because I do think we need a new policy. I think there's enormous frustration from the public after they see these images. And there's frustration from a lot, the rest of us, that the public doesn't see everything um, that I think would provide a much more balanced view of what's going on. And I can't help but think that if we had a process where perhaps the council um, uh, could identify, for example, incidents of substantial public concern in addition to those critical incidents that are identified in AB 748, because I understand there are plenty of incidents during these protests that don't rise to a critical incident because there was not great bodily injury, for example. Um, but it would seem to be in that case, we could set up a simple mechanism for the release of those videos to address what we know is a perception that is slanted by a very narrow view of, of, of whatever happened. And so I'm saying this because uh, I'm telling you, this is where I'm, I'm thinking right now um, as we think about the weeks and months ahead and if that is something that raises concern, it would be helpful to know. And I guess I would also say to the extent that 748 talks about discharge of firearm, I don't know if that includes rubber bullets or not under the statute. Uh, Nora, can you tell me? <laughs> Do you have any idea off the top of your head? If it doesn't, you don't know, it, I understand. It, it isn't clear. Um, and I have to go yeah. back and look at the uh, legislative history to see if that was intended. Yeah. So it's a firearm. Probably, yeah. And I don't know whether, for example, the, the injury to Derek Sanderlin would qualify as GBI or SBI under the statute either. But I, I guess it, it seems to me if we're under a requirement under state law anyway with critical incidents, then we ought to take the additional step for the sake of transparency and accountability. And I say that because other cities are doing just that in Seattle, San Francisco, New York. Uh, and I think we could do better by having a policy that says, look, when the council or maybe some other mechanism, city manager, 
uh, says, hey, this is obviously an issue of substantial public concern. Let's just get the video out um, to address the, the questions. Yes, there are lawsuits undoubtedly, but let's face it, those litigants are gonna get it anyway through discovery. Um, and I just don't, you know, I don't understand why we'd wanna hold back unless again, we're putting people in danger by doing so. So I think I've, I've gone off my soliloquy. If anybody, you know, Dave or, or, or Chief or anybody wants to respond, I'm certainly happy to hear what you have to say. And certainly, yeah, as, as Chief Garcia mentioned, we've, we've been having this discussion and certainly I think there's merits to what you're talking about. So I, I, do, I do think it's something that we should integrate into the work plan here and figure out what, what, it, what does it look like and bring that back to the council and make sure we're all comfortable. I mean, I think there are some trade-offs here, uh, but I, I think um, in most cases, these are probably trade-offs we're probably willing to accept and, and move forward with something like you're talking about. So um, I, I think we can take that back and, and like I said, put that into the work plan and kind of bring that back for a more kind of thorough evaluation and discussion with the council. I would just, I would just, I would just, I would just add one thing. I think it'd be important also uh, to bring in or uh, maybe just get uh, DA Rosen's perspective on it a little bit, because there is, there is the, the incident that's going to occur where we have body worn camera footage where there may have been criminal wrongdoing. Uh, and to the extent that there is some criminal wrongdoing, how would that affect any, uh, any criminal uh, exposure to that individual if there is? Uh, and that's just something that I think, I'm not saying it's a roadblock, but I think it's certainly something that we probably should have a conversation with our DA about. Yeah, agreed. Thank you, uh, Chief. Okay, uh, and Nora, I'm sorry, did you have any opinion or you would rather uh, weigh in later? <laughs> No, the, the question on firearms is, is one that, um, I mean, the, 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 uh, those weapons are considered less than lethal. It's not clear what was meant by firearm, but the subsec, there's another section that talks about great bodily injury. And so there, it may be that the use of that type of um, non-lethal weapon falls under that category, but we can look at that and, and uh, confirm it. It's just an open question right now on the firearm. Section. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you, Nora. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilmember Davis. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Actually, you had the same line of questioning. I was wondering, in in the era of you know ubiquitous cell phones and social media, what is the benefit of withholding when our our own video footage, even when saying for ongoing investigations and litigation? I guess I don't understand how it could even interfere with that, given how, again, how ubiquitous cameras are in the hands of everyone else. Yeah, again, Councilmember Davis, I'll just say what we said before. It's I don't necessarily disagree with uh, both you and the mayor on this issue with regards to getting body worn camera footage out. Uh, however, we, we've been in discussions as to what that process would look like because we have to look at, at it, look at it throughout uh, the entire, uh, you know, the entire spectrum of force uh, and whether the exposure to the city, uh, whether criminal uh, allegations against the officer uh, or other things. Um, and we just we're, we're working on trying to find a process to do that because I think we're in a new age where we are going to have to be more transparent with body cam footage. That's a reality. Uh, but I think we're just trying to find a process that is consistent across the board to be able to do that. Yeah, and I, I, I support that. I understand the need for a consistent process. I would, I would encourage you all to, um, especially, I, I think, Mayor, I, I like the idea of um, talking about incidents of great public concern that may warrant a an expedited process compared to what our whatever the um, the process is that is put in place that may take a little bit longer. Um, and I, I would I would also err on the side of releasing more sooner. Um, again, I think I, I would echo what the mayor said. I think it helps. It improves our transparency, but it also will help the public understand the context better because 
we will provide more than five seconds of footage. We're not going to be putting it up on TikTok, right? We're not. We're going to have the videos. I mean, the videos that we we have here. I'm going to be honest. I did not watch all of them because some of them were over an hour long. <laughs> um, but all of that is there and available for the complete context of what was happening. And I think it's important for us to to have have that be out in the public. Council Member, I don't disagree. I'll say this. We have uh, we have been putting up our uh, our 45 day footage on our OISs. We've been doing that. I'll say that one of the things I think we're going to need to figure out is how do we define videos of great public concern? Uh, because that definition is going to be very important. Because for one individual, it's going to mean one thing. And for another individual, it's going to mean something else. Uh, and so that's the consistency that I think that I know that the city manager is working uh, with the city attorney's office and with the police department to try to figure out that definition so we're consistent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, any other comments? Uh, let me just, I know we don't have a motion yet. Uh, if anyone would consider making a motion, I just ask that perhaps consider asking staff to, to return to council. Um, through obviously uh, if, if the if the staff needs uh, time for this to go back through rules to discuss work plan and um, and, and workload uh, but basically uh, coming back with a proposal uh, for what a release of video particularly body worn camera video footage of incidents of, of great public concern uh, what that policy might look like. Uh, that would that would be a suggestion. Uh, Councilmember Perales. I'm happy to make that motion to accept the staff report and, and include that for the direction. My only question would be, should we do this uh, independent of the other work we're doing or should we fold this into the work of um, reimagining policing? Uh, I, I, you know, I think um, I'm comfortable with either one, but I don't know if staff has a, um, an interest. I think my my initial interest on the process of reimagining policing here in San Jose was that we actually didn't have a lot of independent one-off, um, you know, issues that we were working on, and that we did um, do something that was more comprehensive. So that way we could talk about all these different circumstances, different ways to improve policing here, um, and bring forward that comprehensive package maybe of, of reforms. And so, uh, you know. My, my inclination would be maybe this should be included in there, um, but uh, happy to hear from, from staff. Second. Yeah, if, if I could just, um, so I, I think, um, I, I do think integrating it into the work plan, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's, there's these kind of major streams of work that, are, that need to happen. And, and some of it, I think we wanna have sincere engagement with the community on. I do suspect there's other pieces of it that are maybe more administrative in policy that we might feel comfortable moving forward, um, you know, in advance of some of that community engagement. So I'd, I'd like the chance for us to kind of evaluate the work plan from that perspective and, 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 and figure out with you all kind of what do we really want to send through the community engagement and reimagining kind of process and, and what can we put in another package that would say, no, these are a little more straightforward and, and we want to go ahead and make these advancements now rather than later. And if, if I can add, um, there, are, there are some discrete items on the work plan that I, I, I agree with Dave that we, we want to capture and we have captured like the rules of professional conduct for officers that we may advance some preliminary changes on that but we would still run it through the future of policing and what, it, what that might look like just for feedback as well to see if there's any other revisions that need to be made. So I think we can move ahead on things and as David said and not wait, but some of these things we might revisit as we go forward if there's great community concern. Oh, okay, that actually sounds, um, that sounds better. I think I like this idea of, of maybe a parallel approach with some of these items where we would already begin work maybe independently Maybe some of that as well could be included or incorporated into the conversations of reimagining policing in general, 
Um, but we may, you know, again, we may we may advance that work sooner than the reimagining policing uh, reforms come forward. And so uh, I'm comfortable with that. And I believe uh, Councilman Rodarena seconded the motion. Okay. Uh, thank you for making the motion, Councilman Frost. I, I guess uh, I, I don't want to lose the focus though on these particular incidents. And I, I don't think there's a lot of dispute that these are incidents of significant public concern um, as judged by all the feedback we've gotten uh, through social media, through media, et cetera, that there are plenty of folks who are concerned about these. Um, what could the administration say about these particular incidents? And by that, I mean the ones you've already got in the, where you provided the video that's in the public domain. Uh, would that be part of that work stream? Or uh, it seems to me if, if you've already decided this is something that obviously the council is interested in. Is there a way for us simply to get some of this video out? Um, I think that um, based on the interest and the initial direction on this, we would use that as a starting point as starting to look at that as a definition working with as what, you know, uh, the chief Garcia has said, we can look at that as, you know, issues of great community concern as a starting point and address that as part of this bigger issue issue of how we'd be consistent with this and bring this all back together. Um, and again, okay. we can be, and so I think we'll just, we'll, we'll fold all this in together related to the specific incidents that were initially requested. Okay. Dope. All right, any other comments? All right, on council member Paralysis motion, let's vote. Can I clarify what, accept the report and what was the, the details? So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to state, but Mayor, I don't know if you wanted to reiterate it. Uh, go ahead and take a shot at it since your motion. <laughs> I'll fill yep. in any gaps. So uh, the, the Mayor's additional request and what we were discussing here was that we would uh, return with the, uh, the, the this concept of releasing uh, videos, um, obviously outside of our current practices. Um, that's kind of a, a quick synopsis, but it would be, uh, I think that would be the gist of it, Mayor. I don't know if you wanted to be more specific on it. Yeah, a, a process for the immediate release of video of incidents of great public concern. I'm sorry, yeah, it did. Uh, it, the great public concern was, was part of that initial language. Thank you. And not smoothly worded, but I'll get that that word smithed correctly. Um, but yeah, Tony, it's it's video release. The, 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 that's yeah, what I have. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, the word video is in there. Yeah, all right. Um, yeah. Jimenez? And, it's, and Tony, if, if yeah. this is Nora, it was immediate release. It was a timing. Uh, not just me, not media release, but immediate release. Okay, immediate release, got it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank, see, this is why I asked. Thank you. <laughs> I think you're seeing I um, text me that while I call the, the rest of the roll. Corrales? Uh, I, and thank you for typing up the, the motions. That this is very helpful. Yep. Aye. Crosco? Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Yes. Marinas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. And Jimenez texted to verify that he was trying to say yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Item 4.3 actions related to police reform reimagining police and strengthening investigative authority of the office of the IPA. Obviously much more uh, substantive item here with uh, several subparts. Um, now there are two memoranda here submitted, one describing a series of potential reforms and, and a second one discussing public outreach, how that can be integrated with all the necessary outreach, both reimagining policing, uh, doing a use of force review, which I think can be integrated and 
we know, of course, there's going to be a new chief in the department as well. And I think there's a desire that has been expressed. Um, and I think our current chief, in fact, mentioned this, that the new chief is going to want to be a part of this public process and somehow listening to the community. And so uh, I want to be respectful to that. I think that's what this memo reflects from several of us. Um, Dave or Chief, did you want to say anything before we go to the council? Uh, no, thanks, Mayor. I mean, I, I pretty much addressed this in my opening comments already, so I think we're good. Thank you. All right. Are there any comments, questions? Uh, Councilmember Pross? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And uh, and I, I can support this direction and, in fact, the, the, the number of memos that are attached to it um, as we move forward. I think my initial intent, uh, well, I don't think I know, uh, it's getting a little late here, uh, but my initial intent from the June 11th memo that I submitted uh, was that this, this concept, <coughs> excuse me, of reimagining policing uh, could really give us an opportunity to truly thoroughly vet out uh, the community concerns, to invite the community to participate in that conversation. Um, as we've heard a number of individuals uh, making uh, demands and requests of us as a, as a council and our police chief and our police department. Um, and, and I think that uh, these are worthy conversations for us to have. Uh, what I was never in favor of was was uh, a knee-jerk reaction uh, to all the incidents, uh, many disturbing, right, that we've seen, uh, whether nationally or, or here locally in our own city, um, but a knee-jerk reaction to, um, to, to, to what some might believe are just simple solutions uh, to complex problems, and, and, and that I don't believe is, is uh, the right way to go forward, uh, but I absolutely do believe that uh, we can benefit uh, from a process, a public process um, of reimagining policing here in San Jose. And certainly I bring a personal perspective um, of, of being a, an officer for, for eight years and, and now continuing on as a, as a reserve um, and um, proudly right, served in that role and still do as a reserve um, and, and got into that line of work um, for, I think, the reasons why, you know, our community would hope individuals get into the, the line of work of policing um, and, and now have an opportunity as uh, an elected official to be able to, to bring together um, the, the different opinions that we have and, and hopefully be able to come forward with something that really is transformational and, um, and does address the, the concerns that we've seen and not just something that I think is, is independent on on one side or the other of of, of this issue um, but as i pointed out in that initial memo from also being a, an officer myself and, and i know that this you know opinion is shared by a lot of officers there are quite a number of things that officers are called upon to manage uh, and address in our society today um, that i don't think officers should be responding to and, and a number of officers um, don't think so either and yet we, we really depend and uh, rely on uh, calling 911, rely on police officers responding uh, for the most part because nobody else will. There's nobody else there, um, you know, or, or uh, they're, they're professionals that maybe do that line of work are, are not 24-7, uh, 365 employees. Uh, you name it, a number of, of, of reasons why. Um, but the reality is, is that we have, I believe, in this society come to rely on 911 and our police officers, our emergency response, um, and, and just a few individuals in the emergency response uh, to handle the myriad of, of problems that we have, and not just criminal, uh, many of them social issues. And, um, and, and I don't think that that's, that's proper. I don't think that's the best response we should be giving to our community. And in fact, I don't think that's the, the best that we, we um, are asking, uh, or I think in fact asking too much out of uh, individual professionals like police officers, asking individuals, um, as I had pointed out in, in that original memo, right, to at times act as, uh, as counselors, act as uh, mental health uh, workers, um, uh, and, and, and a number of other hats, right, that, that our, our officers have to wear 
uh, from one call to the next, literally. And, um, and, and so I think that, that, you know, that's where really, I think as, as the conversations were arising, uh, I looked back on my own history as, as an officer and then even today and in, in the number of of conversations and interactions I've had and, and uh, other officers' opinions. And, and really, you know, what we were hearing from the community uh, and what they were asking, and I saw a lot of similarities. And, uh, and that's where I think this opportunity of reimagining policing can, can really help move us forward. Um, and, and I do think we need all voices at that table. And so, and that, you're know, right, from, from our uh, police union on one side uh, of, of the issue, if you will, and, and from individuals that have stepped up and demanded that we de simply defund the police, um, right? I think that, that we need to ensure that we have uh, a broad representation um, as we move forward in this opportunity. And so that's really my, my, my main questions here now, because uh, I will support the, uh, all the, the memoranda that are attached to uh, this item, and I think it's just the two uh, joint memos. Um, That's correct. But I'm really just interested from Dave yourself on, especially since now we're 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 going to tie this into the two other uh, processes that we have going on. And I actually fully agree with that. And the reason why, um, as we're selecting a new chief, we're going to want to engage pretty much the same you know, individuals and organizations, uh, community stakeholders in that conversation, no doubt. Um, as the mayor points out, right, if we're going to have uh, a new chief, well, then we, we absolutely want that individual to be a part of, of this reimagining uh, process. We don't want to leave them out. Um, and, and as well, any reforms that we have within our IPA office, uh, it, again, it's going to be the same stakeholders and organizations, <coughs> excuse me, that we're going to want to invite to the table. And so rather than, than separate uh, those conversations, um, I agree with, with combining them. But the, the question that I have then is, is, is really in regards to, um, in regards to timing and, so, and what that, that looks like. And, uh, and Dave, in regards to how we might be selecting who is going to participate in this process. I know that we've done this before when we have um, gone out on a, on national searches for a new chief, um, and 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 so, but that was that's not necessarily a, a fully uh, open or inclusive process on who gets to sit on that. Uh, I have the experience; we all have the experience now of deciding who sat on the Google Stationary uh, Advisory Group, right? And 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 so, I think we have some models, but I wanted to hear your thought on that. Yeah, thank you, Council Member. Um, yeah, and I, I do think we we need to bring to the council kind of a, that what that looks like that plan for the, the police chief recruitment process because I think certainly we know, we want a, a process where we're able to engage the community and, and stakeholders and and also you know the neighborhoods you know it's it's a lot of different perspectives that I think we want to hear from and, and as we're talking here it's it's in the selection of the police chief and it's in the the Police reform work plan, and it's it's in reimagining um, police work, and so I think it's it's that that whole spectrum of work. You know, I do want to you know give Angel and Jennifer a chance, and in, in working with uh, uh, you know our team on kind of so what what does that look like? What would we like to propose to you? Because um, I do think we have some opportunities for engaging the community in in, in ways that we maybe haven't done before. Um, you know, we are, we are still in COVID, and so we're going to have to figure out a way of doing that in, in the current um, pandemic environment as well. But I, I don't want that ever to be an excuse for us not being able to achieve true community engagement where the community feels engaged and feels like we're listening and feels like they are playing a role in, in the process and playing a role in selecting the police chief. And, and as you mentioned to me, Important stakeholders include, you know, the, uh, the POA and our workforce. Um, typically, when we recruit department heads, we also engage the workforce <laughs> about about that. And so, all of those things are going to be important. You know, I wish I, I had a schedule ready for you right now. We just haven't been able to do that. I, I really wanted to make sure that the council was all on the same page with today's actions, and particularly this one, 
so that we can really make sure we're on the same page and then move forward with that. I did want to give Angel an opportunity to kind of, because I think, you know, uh, Jennifer and Angel and I've been talking through some different ideas around kind of what that community engagement could look like. And then, but Angel, before you jump in, just if, if uh, as on the point you just made, Dave, I, I would like it to understand when we would have that conversation and when we would have a better idea on the timing on the, the selection. So maybe Angel will get into that now, but I'd like to have that more clear before we, we, we end our vote tonight. So th thanks, uh, thanks council member, thanks Dave. Um, yeah, our, our plan would be to come back uh, by the 25th of, of September uh, with, with, with a plan that's kind of thought out with really kind of the, the three deliverables that, that you and Dave both mentioned in mind, you know, the, the use of force review, the selection of a police chief, and, and really a, a more comprehensive view on reimagining re police. And, and as you mentioned, uh, Councilmember Perales and as Dave outlined, you know, it, 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 this is probably gonna be some of the, the most important work that we do over the next few months uh, and, and, and really emphasize the importance. I, I noticed you use the word, the, the plural of, of voices, and that's exactly what we wanna do is, is there's so many different voices, right? And some of them are, are closely aligned and some of them are very divergent. And our goal is, is gonna be to kind of outline a framework and a process that, that is gonna be neutral, open-minded, candid, um, objective, uh, ha has uh, has a ra racial equity lens uh, included in it, and, and as we know, uh, you know there may be a good possibility that there's going to be little agreement. We hope that that's not the case, but but we know that that's kind of what we're walking into, right? But I think if we preserve the integrity of that process, I think we'll end up with a good product at the end of the at the end of the day. And really, when you think about it, you know, you know, per perhaps the question is how we reimagine community safety, right? It, it, it's it's I think even more than just reimagining the police, looking at community safety from a standpoint of there's various stakeholders, including of course the police, which plays a significant role within that. But then there's so many other aspects. There's a public health perspective. There's a community-based uh, perspective. There's a faith-based perspective. So our goal is really to lay out a framework that's gonna really tap the voices and the sentiment uh, of all those various perspectives, synthesize them in a way that makes good sense and, and in a way that's in the best interest of uh, you know, the residents of San Jose. That's gonna be kind of the task at hand. We don't have it all figured out yet in terms of process. Our goal would be to come back on the 25th with, with a more detailed plan on how to do that. Um, and so that's kind of where, where we are as of, as of now. Thank you, uh, Angel. And, and uh, Mayor, I did just recognize as well that Councilmember Jimenez has his hand up and I know that he's running low on battery there. So I'm, I'm gonna pause uh, for now. Okay. I, I may come back after. Thank, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over yeah. to him. If I'm actually good for now, so please continue. Oh, yeah, okay, maybe up. he's got some juice. Well, well, the power's not back up, but I got some juice on my other computer. So. <laughs> okay, uh, well, then I just, uh, I'll, I'll, it's I'll, very I'll, dark right now. <laughs> please. I'll respond then to uh, the angel. Oh. Uh, I'll, I'll just respond to, to angel and say, uh, thank you, angel, for, uh, for one, on the timing, that was I wanted to get that clear, so that that's that's obviously clear on the 25th um, to have have that uh, laid out for us, and that way we can can chime in on that. I, I know that everybody here probably recognizes, um, right? There there may even be a difference of opinion even on 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 what that looks like as just setting it up, right? And we had that with the Google tag process, right? On on who or the stakeholders were. Um, so we want to make sure we're very thorough in each of uh, each of the decisions we'll make here. But I really do appreciate as well your comment on um, a, a broader perspective. I think we need to start with the idea of reimagining policing because policing is the focus. But the reality is, is that what we are talking about in the end, right, is more than just policing. It's the public safety, uh, right, in, in which clearly um, I think, right, that includes a lot more individuals. And it should if it doesn't today, right, if it doesn't include more mental health workers to go and respond to calls with uh, individuals suffering from a mental health crisis or individuals that are homeless. Uh, if it still just, you know, in, involves the police uh, department, police officers, then we still have a problem. And so absolutely. And that's why I think from the start, I had made comments and, and others as well that we need to include the county, uh, right, in, in these conversations. And um, right. And, and, and we need to have this 
be uh, inclusive of the different individuals that ultimately we think may be the proper professionals on some of these calls. Um, so I appreciate that, and I do look forward to the discussion. Uh, I, I, I don't know if somebody seconded, but I, uh, I, I will make the motion for uh, incorporating both the memoranda and, and accept the staff uh, report. Thanks. Second. Motion, Councilman Prowl, second of Vice Mayor. Um, Councilman Jimenez, I, I noticed when you were trying to interact with us, I, I understand you can hear us, but we cannot hear you hardly at all. And so what I would suggest can you uh, hear is, me? Can you hear no, me now? We're, we're hearing you as if uh, your, your speech is very slurred. I know you're sober, so I know that's not the problem, uh, but it's clearly not coming over clearly. Uh, so what I would recommend is that you would text to me or to another council member who you are confident will recite your questions appropriately. Um, and perhaps uh, then we could, or to the clerk, whoever you want to text it to, uh, and then perhaps we can get your questions and comments out there. Uh, just throw that out there for you to con consider until we can get your audio up. Uh, Council Member Esparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a, a few questions. Um, first, I'd like to ask uh, Siobhan what she believes would be needed for the investigative capacity um, and what she believes she would need um, and what that would look like. So council member, thank you for the question. Um, as you know, we'll be working with the city manager to um, develop some kind of transition and, yeah. and reimagining of our auditor model into an investigative model. But um, number one, I would need um, staff that have expertise in investigations. Um, and I would want to have that staff be at a pretty high level. Um, I would probably imagine having investigators that have some um, experience in um, the criminal justice system, whether they are retired law enforcement or um, public defender investigators, because they know the criminal justice system. Um, and I think they would make a, a better fit for the office versus somebody who does, um, you know, investigative work for maybe a, a, a county health service. Um, the, the level of expertise um, would be especially important because um, I think as the chief mentioned, we will get buy-in only if the process is fair. And um, a person who knows uh, law enforcement, um, whether from the PD perspective or law enforcement is going to be a person that will do a better level of investigations um, at, and come on board at a quicker rate than training someone who does not have those skills. I think, first of all, we would also need to know how many investigators we would need, and that would be something to look at in terms of workload now and the workload that internal affairs currently manages. Another aspect would be who would be doing the criminal investigations. I know there's been some discussion with the public, um, with the district attorney about whether or not his office would be interested and willing to do some of the criminal investigations. Can you hear me? I can, I hear, can you. hear you yep. fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so those are some of the general, um, you know, probably primary issues we would be looking at. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, then I, uh, so I, I wanted to go into a little bit about the community process. I, appreciate all the ideas and suggestions um, that have been put forward. I agree. I think we need a, uh, a community process and that the new chief needs to be included in that. Um, I had a question though. Mayor, in your memo, you mentioned partnering with San Jose State and specifically you mentioned Dr. Greg Woods. And can you explain a little bit about more about why that is and what sort of partnership you had in mind as opposed to some other options that might be out there. I just want to understand um, where that came from. Sure. Um, thank you for the question. So what, and I'm pulling up the memo now so we can, and I believe that was in reference to recommendation number two. Um, the, uh, 
we're, we're, we're looking for, in addition to, obviously, we expect a lot of community organizations have been deeply involved in this, in, in advocacy in particular, will be, uh, will be clearly voicing their concerns and the concerns of the communities and bring people forward. And the idea of being able to reach out to community partners who uh, have not necessarily taken a position uh, one way or another, but are nonetheless able to provide um, uh, either insight or uh, be able to uh, help us um, bring you know, resources uh, to the table, particularly some, some minds to the table that can help us understand better how it works in other cities, uh, offer some, some compare and contrast. Uh, in the case of, of Greg Woods, uh, he's a justice studies uh, professor over there and who's been engaged obviously uh, and has already partnered with us extensively and has offered uh, classes in, uh, in, in you know, history of policing and understanding culture of policing. So this is obviously somebody who's, who's been already invested in the city in some way or another and, and makes sense. I, I don't doubt there are other partners like that as well. And I think city manager, uh, the IPA and others can help us identify those partners. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I actually, uh, my preference would be if staff could take that suggestion and look around and see if there might be some other um, academics uh, that could be resources to this project process um, and just and make recommendations on what they think the best ones would be because um, that's a good suggestion. Um, I also had uh, a question and I guess this is for Dave. Um, I do appreciate and it's really important to me that we engage neighborhoods i think so often um this becomes um an issue around sort of uh advocacy on a side or another and i think so often our neighborhood folks get left out and need to be included and um and so one, I wanted to make sure that we do engage neighborhood folks. Um, and then two, there's a, an idea on engaging folks in neighborhoods with the most crime. And so I wanted to um, ask about how we're going to engage those folks, both neighborhoods and some high crime areas. Because I'd like to remind folks that um, a lot of crime victims <laughs> are people of color as well. And uh, that's... Um, piece of information that gets often overlooked. And, um, and so I just wanna make sure that, you know, when uh, we bring a process forward that we get input from all of the stakeholders. Yeah, thanks council member. And yeah, you know, certainly the, we're talking about neighborhood engagement um, it has to be a critical piece of this. Um, we obviously all know we have many neighborhoods across the city that with various different perspectives and what they, need from our, our police department. Um, and, and we do need to figure out a way that to be able to engage them in this process from start to finish. Um, and so I do expect that to be part of what we bring back on the 25th is, is some ideas around how we do that neighborhood level engagement um, in addition to all the stakeholders that we've been talking about that need to also have a voice. So um, look forward to bringing that, that back and, and having that conversation with the council. But uh, that's our commitment, absolutely, that, um, you know, the neighborhood voices will not be left out of this. They will definitely ha have a place in this conversation. Thank you. Um, and then I think I brought this up in June, which is, as we talk about reimagining the police force, um, it is critical that we include the county in these discussions, um, especially as we look at deploying mental behavioral health professionals, um, social workers, right? We look at deploying those folks first. Um, we have to remember we don't control that. We, that's really a county system. Um, but it's an important partnership in really making some some fundamental change and hopefully impact, right? Um, so I just, I also wanted to um, ask that we have 
um, a seat or more than one seat in this process for some key county partners. Um, and and I, I know very often we talk about, you know, the, the DA and the public defender, but really I'm talking about mental and behavioral health and the county leadership and whether that's Jeff Smith or someone else in the county executive's office, um, that we include them so that, um, I mean, we both need to buy into this change. It can't just be the city. The county needs to buy into it as well. Um, and, and, and also knowing that, um, you know, I mean, I've had some instances in, in my community where, um, you know, there have been, that law enforcement may still be part of the team that goes out to address something, but at least they won't be leading something that is frankly not in the purview of the police when it really should be mental or behavioral health, um, focusing on that. Um, and, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council member Arenas. Thank you. Thank you, mayor. Um, many of my questions have already been answered. Um, cool. I some of the uh, some of my colleagues asking about the additional resources that will be required for Siobhan for you to take on some of these new tasks and um, and I just want to make sure that you have what you need to be able to to um, uh, carry on uh, smoothly I heard what you said to um, council member Esparza but if there's anything else that you uh, might have forgotten it'd be great to hear from you now Well, I think we're still in the planning stages. Um, again, uh, I think the things I mentioned to the um, councilwoman as far as I were the top three on my list, but again, there'll, there'll be a myriad of details that will be need to be worked through, but um, I think it'll come together. Great, it, it would be a, a travesty that um, for, for limited resources to limit you in terms of uh, the capacity and, and your new tasks uh, that you'll have to take on. Um, I also had questions about um, about the outreach plan. And I appreciate that you've already been asked this by a number of my colleagues, um, uh, city manager. I think you're the one who, um, and Dave, you're the one who responded about uh, the outreach. And I'm, I'm not gonna beat a dead horse because I, obviously I, I want to have our community um, participated, in, integrated into this process, walking along with us, um, and, and to understand that this is the long haul, right? We, we have like a whole bureaucratic process to, ensure that, that all stakeholders are part of this conversation. Um, and uh, it, I know that process is gonna take a long time. And then waiting for, waiting for our new um, uh, chief of police to be part of those conversations, I, I don't know how that's gonna fare out with our community um, because we are, we're penalizing them for the loss of the chief. Um, and we're saying, I understand how important it is for the new chief to be part of these conversations. And so I wonder if there's some aspects of the community engagement that we could um, initiate uh, immediately or uh, as soon as possible while we do this search for a new chief. I, I know that it says here like about six months is the hold off, but finding a new chief may take longer, correct? Longer than six months. Yeah, I, it could. Uh, you know, obviously um, there are many variables in, in, uh, in, in going through a, um, a recruitment process and, and finding a candidate and, 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 and getting consensus on that. You know, I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of looking at it a little differently though, from the standpoint of, you know, as I mentioned earlier, and I, I think the way Angel and, and Jennifer and I see this, it's going to be a continuum of a conversation with stakeholders in the community. It starts with, with the police chief recruitment process, but I think we're going to hear a lot from the community about what they want out of the police department in that conversation. And so, um, you know, and, and, and I do think that 
even the community is going to want to have that voice in, in selecting the police chief. Um, uh, and, and, and so I think that's the, our opportunity to, to, for that engagement to, give, to, to begin fairly soon. Um, and as, as Jennifer was mentioning earlier, I do think there's opportunities with work on the work plan, the, the police reform plan that we can bring forward. Um, but you know, in my guess is as soon as we engage the community on the recruitment of the police chief, we will be in at the start of a conversation about a reimagining the police department at that point. Uh, I don't know if Angel, if you wanted to add anything there. Yeah, yeah, Dave. Uh, you know, you know, in a lot of ways, we would be customizing this process kind of in two ways, right? One is customizing it around COVID, right? Because that that obviously has been a game changer. But we're also approaching this with a sense of urgency and also customizing it around a sense of of identifying any low hanging fruit to the extent that as we begin this process, we identify actions that we can take immediately to address issues that where, where we have pain points now, there's nothing that would preclude us from taking those actions in the interim, right? Or, or, or immediately. Meanwhile, we kind of, you know, craft a, a path forward, a more systemic, you know, kind of transformation long-term. And so, um, you know, I, I think we have an opportunity here to, could not, to for us to not use the, the traditional community engagement you know, process uh, and timeline. Uh, I think we, we, we should accelerate wherever we need to accelerate and then take the time where we need to take the time for, for long-term sustainable change. So that's kind of the thinking that we're, we're going into this. We don't have it all ironed out just yet, but that's some of the preliminary thinking. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that. I, I know that, uh, you know, we want details from a, about a process that we don't exactly know what it is just yet. And uh, there's so many variables and I get that. Um, but I, I, think you, you, I think you can understand that there's a sense of urgency for us to make sure that um, we start this process and the sooner the better. Um, I wanna make sure that our residents um, have continue to have uh, confidence in what we're doing and that we are being as transparent as we can um, and, and honoring their feedback. Um, so I, I appreciate your response. Um, the last comment that I wanna make is, um, I also uh, would, had a similar, had have similar feedback as council member, um, as far as the, um, when she, as she picked up uh, in terms of uh, the city manager exploring partnerships, um, with subject matter experts. And um, I have a couple of cities, um, actually GARE cities that are doing some police reform reimagining. Um, and so I'd like to, for you to also um, re research that. For example, in, um, in Albuquerque in New Mexico, they created a new city department to respond to 911 alongside first responders to focus on mental health, violence prevention, homelessness, and social workers. Obviously, that's kind of a county city uh, collaborative. And it sounds like um, we, we also need to have more of a collaborative with our, our county uh, counterparts. In uh, Durham, North Carolina, they invested a million in community alternative policing. And they're auditing their 911 calls so that they can reassign functions to other city departments regarding mental health and homelessness and all of that. Um, and uh, let's see, Grand Rapids, Michigan, they established a, a police policy and proce procedure review task force with a national police expert and uh, two residents per district. So there, you know, and I have a whole list of these. And so I think it, we could learn from other cities who are, possibly uh, ahead of us on, on some of these. Um, uh, we all are, of course, uh, are uh, distinct in, in, in our uh, culture and our cities, but um, it's always great to learn from others, especially uh, lessons learned that, that might cost us some, um, uh, that could be harsh for, for us, um, a lesson to, to learn. So. I like for us to, to review some of these GARE cities and I can forward this uh, to you, Dave, uh, later on and Angel as well. Uh, and so I think it, it's just part of exploring uh, further partnerships. And I think we could look at the GARE cities as potential um, 
uh, subject matter experts alongside uh, Dr. Woods. I see you shaking your head, Angel. So I, I'm going to yeah. yeah. agree. <laughs> no, I, I, I completely agree. And what I would add to that is that, you know, our intention would also be to really look at academia, for example, to see kind of what best practices and longitudinal studies th that are out there that we could draw upon, as well as, you know, practi practitioner uh, experiences, right, in terms of what other cities and, yeah. and, and all, all are doing, um, and, and really synthesizing all that uh, in, into this work. And, and really not starting from scratch, right? Or, or not, not necessarily starting, uh, having to reinvent everything all over again, but really drawing on those best practices or at least those that are applicable here in our city. Um, and, and along those lines is, is doing that on a parallel track with making sure that we have a, a multidisciplinary team of experts around the table, coupled with the right community stakeholders, ha you know, asking the right questions, talking through the right issues, uh, you know, vetting all that, and then really, you know, applying these, you know, the, 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 these new ways of thinking to our city, and, and, and also looking at our own crime ana analysis data, not only crime analysis data, but also, um, you know, kind of unreported data and anecdotes that we get from the community, right? And, and if you think about it, this process in some ways has already begun, because for the last few months, there has already been a lot of public comment. Uh, by way of various uh, council items, you know, I think we could also go back and draw on that as well. And in addition to that, cast an even broader net to also go tap into the other voices that we have not heard from either, right? So it's really just making sure that we really capture and engage our, uh, our community at large uh, to do this work right and effectively. Thank you, Angel, and I, 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 I'm glad that you uh, drew a distinction between academia and actual practitioners, um, because there, there is a, a huge difference, right, in terms of research and then um, implementation and what we figure out really works for, for uh, certain cities. Um, this policy never is perfect, and so once you implement it, it's sometimes a different story. I don't know if you wanted to add something, Dave. I know that you... It looked like you did, and I'm not sure if you, you want to continue. Uh, thank you. No, the uh, angel covered the base well. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, those are my questions. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Camus. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I uh, do want to also have voices at the table, as, as I said in the Rules Committee meeting, who understand policing. Um, and and the the dangers and pitfalls of policing, um, and I you know and and I know we've heard a lot from people who want to, for example, defund or, or change policing altogether, um, and we are doing so many so many different things. I just want to make sure that we're not losing sight of of of, um, of the concerns that police actually have in in policing. And, and I also wouldn't mind having people at the table that are, you know, not necessarily uh, from, from the points of view that, that everything is going wrong. I mean, I, I, I know that in my district, uh, we have a lot of concerns about increased burglaries, uh, speeding, and what can be done in policing to better, uh, to, to better, you know, help with those issues. So I'm hoping to have other perspectives of it other perspectives at the table. Is that something, Angel, that, that you're in agreement with or, or how's that gonna work? No, no, absolutely, in fact, if, if we're gonna do this right, uh, you know, I, I used the word objective earlier and, and neutral, you know, we, we need to convene all the stakeholders, right? Uh, and, and again, that's, that's easier said than done. And, and, and also recognizing that there's a lot of frustration and anger and emotion in the conversation right now. And, and I think we all go into this knowing that that is still gonna play out, right? We're still in that kind of storming phase, if you will. But really, I think the goal would be is to kind of really move from, 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 you know, from frustration and anger to action, right? And, and the only way we're gonna do that is if we, if we convene you know, the right people around the table, and that's inclusive of, uh, of, of the police perspective and all that. Uh, and, and that's kind of in line with this whole idea of really reimagining community safety as an overall community, obviously starting with police because that's what this is all about. So we'll kind of lead with that. Um, but uh, it, absolutely, it's gonna be very important to, to include that perspective at the table. 
And, I, and just to add, I think it's important that we get a baseline education of what our police department has done related to police reforms because we have led the nation in a lot of great work as the mayor pointed out at the very beginning. And we do need to get everybody to understand what that is because I don't think everybody's on the same knowledge base of what we have done and how do we build from that. And as, the, as, the, as uh, Chief Garcia said, and, and, and continue to grow and to learn and make better. And where have we done really well in there? Where do we still have a lot of work to do? And because we, we continually need to evolve. So I think it's also very important that everybody gets grounded with some some basic information about what our you know what our police department has done and and where their successes and where they need to work on. Well, thank you. I, I thank yield. You. Uh, okay, thank you, um, Councilmember Jimenez. Uh, All right, Mayor. Let's try this. Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can now. All right, cool. I'm still in the dark, so it's a little difficult to read my my well, just things that I wrote down. And so let me try to remember <laughs> or sit through some of this stuff. Uh, the the first thing I just want to say is that I very much uh, appreciated the memos. Uh, I know I wasn't in that Brown Act, but uh, I was looking through them very uh, intently and appreciate everything that's in there. I do have some questions about some of the uh, information. Um, Specifically, I think it's the memo dated, um, let's see, try to find, uh, the one that's dated July 30th, you, Council Member Dip, uh, Council Member Carrasco, Vice Mayor Jones, I think that one excludes uh, Council Member Perales, right? That's right. Yeah, so, so, and I think I, I was looking at the folks that were still in attendance. I see that Joe, Joe Royce is still hanging out with us, it seems, after his presentation earlier in the evening. Is that is that the case? Yes, I'm still here. Oh, cool, cool, very cool. So, so You're a patient you know, man, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for hanging out with us, Joe. Um, so the question I have, sorry, I'm, I'm literally with a candle, I try to look at the, 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 what I wrote down. So, so on number six, uh, it talks about uh, uh, return the rules committee to add to the city auditor's work plan on the audit of San Jose Police Department expenditures and workload. Uh, expanding the scope of the existing staffing audit to incorporate analysis of calls for service uh, and, and something that stood out to me that I think is very important is police budgetary allocations and progress towards civiliz civilianization, which I know that has been the talk of, topic and, and seems to be the focus when we talk about reimagining, which I, I think is appropriate, but I, but I think uh, I see it maybe slightly a little differently. Um, and so what I was curious about, Joe, is is because what came to mind here is the timeline. I know that uh, we're putting a lot before all of you uh, to, to start moving forward. And I think uh, uh, we're being called upon to do so by the community. But I'm curious as to what you think about the timeline on this. Like, when, when could this be completed, this audit? Well, thanks for the question. So this is an audit. The police staffing audit is something that we started earlier in the year and we began and then we put on hold during COVID and we just re-engaged with the department uh, a few weeks back, about three weeks ago now. Um, and seeing, we, we had some requests from council members and seeing this come through, we've, we've added this to our scope to that. It will take a little time. Um, it is, it is a, a, quite a bit of work. Right now I'm, I'm hoping to have it um, kind of work through uh, the rest of this year and hopefully have something early next year um, oh, wow. okay. before the budget season, definitely. So that's the timing that we're looking at um, right now. It, okay. I don't know how it really lines All up right. with what Angel was describing and, and what have you, but that's what we're, we're hoping for right now. Okay. All right. I, I was uh, hoping it'd be a little, a little sooner than that, but I understand obviously it's a lot of work. The, the component of it that, it, that it, I'm sure the whole report, the whole audit will interest me, but uh, the budgetary allocations, and I guess I can reach out to, to our budget office and the folks that run the numbers. I, I'd really like to see sort of a breakdown of what the, you know, because I know, I think the police budget and, you know, th these numbers aren't exactly, but it's about $461 million out of general fund, I believe. I know there's obviously a lot within that. Uh, I assume the majority of that is personnel, which Quite frankly, I'm not interested in touching. I think we're, we're, we're very much a thinly staffed police force, and I think we need more officers. Uh, but I think it's uh, 
I was very much hoping that we'd get that sooner because I, I'd be very much interested in delving a little deeper into that to figure out, you know, the breakdown of where all the money goes. But again, I think there may be other departments that can provide that information. Uh, um, but okay. Councilmember Jimenez. Um, yes. In the in the budget book, and I'm sure you know I can point that out to you or, or Jim Shannon, our budget director. We we did. Um, Break, you have all the departments broken down by program, so you can actually get a deeper dive. Um, that was something that we did a couple years ago and see kind of by program uh, how we're spending the money in the police department. So that might be a good starting point for you, and I can certainly help you, you offline or, or again, Jim Shannon can. Yeah, so, so I know that exists, and I had a brief conversation with Jim Shannon, but I, I guess what I'm curious about is how, how deeply does that go? So, for example, and this is just a, a very elementary sort of example, but if I wanted to know how much money does the San Jose Police Department spend on weapons, right? I mean, is that within that? Does it fall under a broader category? Does it, you know, those are the type of things that I'm interested in. Yeah, I, I think those are, you know, questions that the police department can help answer, but we don't publish okay. that in the, in the budget book per se, but they, we certainly have more breakdown that's outside right. that the department has to... Uh, you know, sure that they're spending their budget and not going right. over. So I'm sure that could be something that uh, we could do. But, you know, again, okay. um, you know, this, you know, systems are a little bit limited and we, some of that might have to be manually done. Yeah. I, and I understand that. I, I've been sensitive not to over, overwhelm you, you, you folks uh, with, with all the questions that I have, but uh, okay. So, so that, that's sort of the, the level of detail that I think would be helpful for when you know when we're making decisions uh, as to where, where some of the money is being spent, but uh, the the other question I had is, uh, and I'm not sure who can answer this, is that uh, you know item number four in the memo, and again I support all this, but I, I just want to better understand it. And so number four it says return to council in closed session. It's mainly about uh, negotiations and such. I know some of the push from some of the community members have been uh, to bake negotiations more public and, and, and some of what's happening more publicly available. But I don't, I guess I'm curious as to what exactly prohibits us from sort of being more open about what the negotiations are looking like and, and things of that nature. I know they're sensitive and I don't know if Jennifer Shembury's on the call, but uh, I'm sure there's things that we need to be cautious about and, you know, negotiating out in public and things of that nature. But are, are there, I mean, what are the constraints there? Are there like the pull bar and other such things that prevent us from more openly sort of sharing some of the negotiations between us and the police department and the POA? And I'm not, I know you're on my screen, Jennifer, but I don't know, I, I, it's to whoever's on the call that can maybe answer it. I can certainly take it offline. And Suzanne Hutchins on and she might be able to uh, uh, explain some of that, Jennifer, if you want. Sure. I, I, can, I can start and just say we, you know, we, several years ago we did look at having at a, at a council member's request we did look at having open uh, public um, negotiations and and decisions were made to not do that but we do publicly um, post uh, all of the um, you know the offers back and forth we are we do publicly post them on the on the city's website. We also added um, an item on the council agenda that usually that's when you, when you go into open session before closed session for the public to comment on labor negotiations. And we have mm -hmm. arbitration uh, allowed uh, in the public as well. In fact, I've been in arbitration and we, we've had uh, them open to the public. But the concept of why you know it, ha it hasn't gone forward, if I recall correctly, is because um, a lot of times there, brain, there is brainstorming at the table and there was a thought at the time when this was being looked at that it could, uh, you know, there's proposals and things like that, that mm -hmm. some of that, if it was all in public, it might be limiting to, to both parties to kind of brainstorm different ideas if it was all to be public. And so a decision was made um, not to go that way, but instead to enhance our transparency. I think we are one of, one of the few cities that does post our proposals back and forth and you can you can actually follow along and see what we have passed forward, and the council and the community can certainly comment on that in uh, at a special agenda item before closed session at any given time. So just to give you okay. some background on it, I don't know if Suzanne yeah. if you have anything else to add. Yes, um, it it actually requires mutual consent. So, for example, back in mm. 2012, the Association of Legal Professionals 
consented to allowing to have open negotiations and I believe some council members attended. But it's under the Myers Millius Brown Act about setting policies and rules around all of that um, where there there needs to be mutual consent. So that's something that's discussed usually on day one and the ground rules for the negotiations. Okay. All right. That, I mean that, that makes sense. Um, okay. I just you know I asked that question just to honor some of the some of the things that have been posed to us by by a number of community organizations and certainly individuals that that want to see more openness in, in everything as it relates to the police. Uh, the the other question I had was for Nora. Uh, Nora and and I don't I think when Rick was around I asked him this question and I think when I asked him this question things were still in progress, but I was curious if you had an update as it relates to the evaluation that was taking place within the city attorney's office on the muni code violations as it related to the curfew and and being out and about. I think Rick told me you, you all were evaluating to see what charges, if any, would be brought. Is there an update on that? And, may, and, and I apologize if there was an info memo or something I, I might have missed. But. No, there hasn't been an info memory memo yet. We are, um, uh, collecting all of the citations or a number of them and um, making a determination as to whether or not they were strictly violations of the curfew or if there were other um, issues and then we'll be making a determination as to whether or not we'll prosecute or not prosecute in the interests of justice. Okay, when do you when do you think that that determination will be in and it, I mean how long do you anticipate taking to evaluate? I expect within either by the end of this month or by the middle of September, we're we're just gathering everything right now. Okay. Not, none okay. of them have been brought forward so far as I, if I'm correct, um, have been brought forward into court so far. We have not um, brought forward a prosecution, if you will. Okay. All right. Um, okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, the, the other question I had was uh, is, and I'm not sure who to direct this to. Maybe. The authors of the memo, because I, I know, I guess this has been brought up on, on occasion by community folks that have sort of uh, chimed in on their with their opinion, and, and that's the banning of tear gas. And I was wondering if that was ever considered to be added to, to, to some of the recommendations as it relates to like banning of rubber bullets and things of that nature. I don't know if someone that was I'd, on the memo. Yeah, I'd be happy to respond, and perhaps the other co-authors want to join in, or or if the chief would like to respond. Um, I know that we're going to undertake a use of force review in which we're going to look at various uses of force uh, as part of this community organ uh, community process. And so that's certainly, I think, um, a fair game. The reason why I didn't push that direction myself uh, was, and by the way, I've been tear gassed before. I know it is painful uh, and I don't recommend it. Um, but I, uh, I, I am concerned about the range of options that a department has to disperse a crowd in a situation where some number of people are violent in the crowd. And it's simply not an option for a police officer or officers to go out into a crowd, be able to effectuate an arrest in a chaotic situation um, and be able to keep people safe. And so the ability to disperse a crowd quickly is often a life-saving tool. And mm -hmm. the question mm -hmm. is, can it be done safely or not? And certainly I think it's you know, a worthy public inquiry to say, are we doing this safely? Is there a risk to, to, to anyone? Uh, and is that risk outweigh the risk of not having the tool? What I don't want to do is to leave police officers with the options of either doing nothing or using a billy club or a gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we know what billy clubs look like and it's ugly. And guns certainly we don't want uh, being the option chosen in a crowded situation. And so there have to be other tools that enable a safe dispersal of a crowd. And I'm well aware that there is there are international conventions that bar their yeah. use uh, as for purposes of war heard that certainly mm -hmm. I know there are some cities that have banned them I understand that um, I am interested certainly in looking at all the alternatives when our, we do our use of force review but unless somebody has a good alternative that ensures that officers are not using deadly force um, 
then it seems to me we have to think about what those intermediate options are. And tear gas certainly seems far safer than, for example, rubber bullets, where we know people have been killed or seriously hurt. Mm -hmm. and, and Mayor, do you expect in all the different, differing sort of uh, an expansive sort of uh, list of recommendations that uh, you and the authors of the of the memos have put forward, that that would be something that would be explored? Sort of what the options are, are as it relates to tear gas and are there, you know, the, the, the triggers for usage and things of that nature? I mean, Yes, I would expect in the use of force review that we would look at all the intermediate uses of force. Uh, I'm sorry, by intermediate, I mean something that's less than deadly. Okay. Um, and to understand, for example, we've had a lot of discussion in past years about the use of tasers. Uh, we know, for example, for someone who's under the influence of stimulants or has a weak heart, that can be fatal. And so that's, yeah. those are all things that are worthy of public discussion. Okay, all right, thank you for that. Um, uh, I'm going to just wrap it up fairly quickly. And, and, and by the way, I'm going to vote yes on this in case I get disconnected or something. Um, but but I, I just want to say that, uh, you know, I know the, the term reimagining police has been, you know, and I think appropriately sort of thrown out there, right? Because I think we do need to reimagine police. And, and I know it seems to me a lot of that's been centered around you know, send, not sending officers to certain calls and things of that nature. But I for me, I think of reimagining police uh, uh, quite literally as putting all the options on the table. And what that means is, apart from the money we spend for personnel, uh, keeping and increasing the number of officers we have, which I think is vitally important, it's what our, our residents demand of us to do, um, I think everything else should be on the table. And I think we should look at the budget we should look at every inch of what the police is allocated and figure out if there's a better use for that, right? And reimagining may be that we create programs for youth instead of, you know, and again, just, you know, buying extra guns or doing, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so I'd like like us that as we go down this path that we, we have an open mind as to what's possible and what we can uh, utilize some of those funds for uh, and, and reimagine it, imagine it in that manner. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that we need to, to think about the, the way we use our officers. And even that, I think, is going to require uh, probably a, a, a re, uh, redirection of some resources that are, maybe go to X, Y, and Z in the police department, right? We're going to say, we're not going to fund this, but we're going to fund social workers or whatever it may be, right? Um, and so I just really think that everything needs to be on the table. There are uh, different things that I've read about, you know, and really uh, preventing kids. You know, the Mayor's Gangs Prevention Task Force, as an example, does some of that work, right? Tries to prevent kids from going down that path where we won't need officers to handle some of that. Um, you know, divert them to college. You know, uh, something the chief did, I think, uh, in Pocoway, took some of the kids to camp. How do, how do we do that, right? And certainly that's an expenditure within the police department. But those are the type of things I think are worth looking at. Um, and so I hope that as we go down this process and, and, and down this path that, that we have an open mind and really uh, try to take in all different perspectives as to how we can truly and, and, and honestly reimagine how the police do their work. Uh, and I can tell you, I, I'm very, and I think it's important to say this because it's out there. Just today, I, I, I was, someone shared a video with me of, of a woman and some officers at a hotel. I'm sure some of you have probably seen that. Um, it, it seems to me to be um, uh, a string, one of a string of different things that have happened recently that have left me very troubled about the current state of our police department. Um, I know it's not all officers. I know that we've done a, had a lot of reforms. I know that I, I personally think the chief has done a good job uh, doing a lot of good outreach to the community that oftentimes, you know, are maybe the most uh, get pushback to officers, but uh, I, I'm worried. I'm worried that maybe there, there's a component in our city uh, that, that is not buying into some of what the chief's selling. Um, and I'm very curious and very um, interested in figuring out how we can root those folks out. Uh, because what I've seen seems inappropriate to me. Uh, and I know, you know, obviously there's pending litigation and things of that nature, but I'm just very troubled. And so I think we really need to look at, at how we're approaching things and really truly honestly uh, reimagine the way we our police does our, the work of the residents of the city of San Jose. So thank you. Uh, thank you.
Uh, Councilor Member Dieb? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, so I wanted to follow up on uh, Councilor Jimenez's question because I think he, he raised some interesting points. Um, some of the community members I did meet with did come speak to me. And on, on the question of public uh, negotiations, I, I really don't feel, at least for, from my understanding of, of what I've heard, that they're really concerned about traditional negotiation issues in terms of, of uh, pay or working conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what they really are trying to focus on is this question of, of officer discipline. And without you know, going into that, I, if we can just daylight for them what the extent of our negotiations with the, between a city and the agency or the uh, POA, like how much of that even goes into that? Because I don't recall um, doing that. I mean, how much of that is controlled by the state? How much of that is controlled locally? It, can we comment on that? So they, they know kind of where to look or not look for their answers? Anybody? Um, I can yeah I, I, I can say that um, the uh, um, agreements with um, the union have um, arbitration for uh, as a uh, appeal process for discipline. Discipline is handled um, by the chief and it goes through the IA process and ultimately up to the chief. So it's handled by the department. And if an officer is unhappy with a disciplinary decision, um, if the union supports the officer, it'll go to arbitration. If the union does not support the officer, then the officer can go to the civil, the city civil service commission, which is where other employees, um, except for fire would take, um, uh, disciplinary appeals. And Suzanne, is there anything you want to add? I just want to make sure I understand the council member's question. Um, so there is an appeal process. It's in the MOA. So that would be something um, negotiated. But as far as like discipline records, the penal code actually precludes disclosure of peace officer personal records, except in two limited circumstances. And those were the amendments that were done to that penal code section under SB 1421 that allows uh, disclosure for sustained findings of dishonesty type cases and sustained findings of sexual assault type cases. Sure, so thank, that, that, that is helpful. And then I guess my only point of asking is because I, I engage with some of the community members and, and they're on a mission, right? Because they, they feel that there needs to be some sort of uh, systematic change. And, and regardless of where we end up on, on what we agree with them or not, I think it's important to help them uh, direct them where to look. And uh, really their question is how much, their question to me at least, is how much does the council negotiate with all the things they're looking for? You know, how quickly can we uh, discipline an officer? Like how can we make those disciplinary decisions stick? Uh, and if some of this is really outside of our jurisdiction in the sense that it's, uh, it's determined in state penal code or, or POBAR or, or something else, uh, we should at least let them know that, that our our proportion of negotiation ability in order to impact these is minimal or uh, non-existent or, you know, we can actually do a lot if we really put our minds to it. So just to give them that clarity um, is all I'm, I'm trying to pull out of the conversation here. But uh, thank you, Suzanne, that, that was helpful. And I'll support the motion on the table. Thank you, Council Member Esparza. Yes, Mayor, I, um, let me fix this again. Um, I actually wanted to follow up on something, which was the idea of looking at police resources. Um, and, and, you know, I just want to be clear that this is important. Why this is illustrates the importance of why we need some neighborhood folks, particularly neighborhood folks who live in areas that, um, that need police resources. And um, I'm, I'm, not willing to just blindly um, pull resources without really having a plan um, moving forward. And, um, and if, if we take some resources and reallocate that to social workers or something else, that we be very clear about the choices that we're making and the impact that those are going to have in, in, in neighborhoods throughout the city. Um, so that's it. I just felt the need to state that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilmember. I, um, I agree with that sentiment. Certainly my experience in community meetings and hearing door to door in the neighborhoods that are most impacted by crime um, and our least affluent neighborhoods is the strong desire for more policing. Uh, as much as there may be frustration about different aspects of police uh, activity, uh, there is a strong demand for, for policing, I hear. Uh, and I think we need to be cognizant of that. And I think while there are certainly alternatives we should consider, I think we need to know where we land before we jump. And I understand that some several cities have moved forward with substantial cuts to their police budgets. Um, I hope them, I wish them well. I hope they, they find the right place to land. Uh, I'm just not confident we can do that in a week's time or two weeks time. I think this takes a lot of uh, thoughtful work and I know we've got a, a team to do it and we've got a community to help us do it right. Um, I, I do want to, um, make mention of two really important elements here. They've gotten a little bit of discussion today, but really are going to consume an awful lot of time from our negotiators in particular, uh, because these are gonna be difficult issues to negotiate um, with the police union. Uh, we know that this is, um, we're really trotting over new ground here. And the first is essentially pulling investigations of misconduct out of the police department and putting them into an independent agency. Um, that is something that has gotten uh, some, I think we've heard from time to time, occasional suggestions to do that. I know that uh, the community organization, police acting, or I'm sorry, people acting in, in community together, PAC uh, had proposed that as well in the past. And, this is a really major shift for us. Uh, the IPA's role under the charter has been to review, not to investigate, and giving them the investigatory authority is a big shift, and I think an important one. Um, I don't believe it represents any lack of confidence in internal affairs at, at the police department or, or, or in the police generally. I think rather it reflects the realization that we're all coming to uh, in the United States of America, which is I think in big cities, Americans are simply not going to accept the notion of police policing themselves. I just think we're kind of beyond that now and, uh, and that we need to move beyond that. And so this is a model that makes sense for us. We were really blazing the trail in the 1990s when we created the IPA office. Uh, and that was in some ways response to what we saw was happening in LA at the time with police abuse. Uh, I think this is also going to blaze some trails. I know there have been some cities that have tried this, uh, but I think we should not forget that the overwhelming majority of cities uh, in this country, more than 98% of them, don't have any independent review of any kind of internal affairs or how the police police themselves. So this will be significant. Um, secondly, this notion of really removing the roadblocks, you know, I consider bureaucratic roadblocks to enabling chiefs to fire bad cops. And that is in the form of, of binding arbitration. I think it desperately needs reform. This is one of those issues that doesn't get much attention in the media. It's unfortunate that it does not. Uh, there was a very good article that came out in the Washington Post back in 2018. They did a study of 35 cities, uh, and I'm sorry, 37 cities throughout the country, not including San Jose and found more than 450 officers that had been fired by police chiefs and were forced, the same police chiefs were forced to rehire those officers after they terminated the officers for severe misconduct. Obviously it has to be pretty significant uh, for someone to get fired. And uh, in every case, you know, it was, a, it was an arbitrator it was basically saying they're gonna split the baby and force the department to take an officer um, who was obviously committing serious misconduct. And we've experienced that ourselves in 2016. And even our police union said, look, we're not gonna represent that particular officer. We believe the conduct wasn't uh, in line with their duty. And, and the chief uh, actually was at the time, I think deputy chief, but now chief Eddie Garcia made a decision to terminate uh, and we were forced to take the officer back. I think that is something that undermines morale in a department. I think it undermines um, the respect that the department has for the ability of the chief to, to really ensure that only the best 
stay in the department. So I, um, I'm hopeful that we're going to make some progress with the police union negotiating changes to both of those elements that will be significant and that will be models for the rest of the country because overwhelmingly cities throughout the country are similarly really chained to this model of binding arbitration, which I think simply doesn't work. Um, so I, I want to make sure at least there was some public awareness of that. Uh, it's been largely overlooked as I think some of the other proposals have been um, captured center stage, you know, defunding we know is pretty dramatic. And so we understand why people uh, will tend to focus on that in the headline. Um, finally, I, I think the work that Joe and his team are going to do is really important around this audit. Um, the reality is I think we're all going to be tightening our belt for the next two years. Having an audit on spending will be helpful anyway, uh, because we're going to need to find every single quarter and every couch cushion. So uh, I look forward to what we can learn there. And I think it's going to be important for us uh, because we know we're going to fill it in every department in the city. Uh, okay, Councilor Pross, you had your hand up for a moment. Uh, I think you took it down. Do you want to add anything before we move on? Uh, uh, no, I, I think you, you covered sort of some of what I wanted to chat about. So I think I okay. can save the rest for the, the process as it begins. Okay, so just before we vote, I know one last question, Nora, um, it was raised from Councilman Jimenez, you know, what exactly are we going to do with, I understand the district attorney has said, hey, city, it's up to you to decide whether or not to prosecute on these curfew violations. I'm assuming the approach we're taking is that unless there's some aggravating circumstance, some other offenses or some significant aggravation to the, the behavior, um, I'm sorry, aggravating circumstance to the behavior, that uh, we're probably going to simply move on. Is, is that right? I think that's fair to say, Mayor. Okay. I uh, appreciate it. I understand that. I know that uh, we typically would not be talking about these kinds of decisions in public, but I think this is a, a matter of such significant public interest. It would sure. be helpful, I think, for folks to understand our, our basic approach. Yeah, that, no, that's, a, that's, a, um, that's how we're looking at it. Okay, thank you, Nora. All right, then we have a motion then, uh, I believe from Councilmember Perales. Let's vote on that motion. Yeah, I have it from Perales for to approve both memos. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Prosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Foley? Aye. Chemis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. And Arenas is absent. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, and finally, 4.4 is the final item on our agenda. Uh, this is the uh, Police Department Duty Manual Amendments. Um, let's go to Council Member Esparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had, I'm still having technical issues, sorry. Um, I had uh, some questions. So is the chief still on? Chief Garcia, are you still with us? Up. Let me turn. Is, uh, is Chief Garcia still on? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, thanks. So um, I had a question. There's uh, some discussion about banning uh, rubber bullets. And so I wanted to ask you, so if we do a straight ban, then what, what tools does the PD have left? to that um that is uh what do you call it um uh less, less lethal deadly tools yeah less less lethal tools less uh lethal. Councilman, yeah so i think jason dwyer's on and so is paul cook but let me just start off with uh, it limits us uh we feel um and we've we've said this before we feel that we have uh we've lessened the scope as to when we could use rubber bullets uh, or not rubber bullets, we keep uh, the rubber baton that we use, uh, that we would only use it on individuals that are actually uh, committing violence, either against uh, the officers or other people in the crowd. 
if we don't have that tool, uh, then it certainly uh, lessens our efficiency in stopping that threat, whether it's from assaulting an officer or assaulting someone else in the crowd. Uh, and so a straight ban on it, uh, we certainly aren't supportive of uh, because it limits our ability uh, to use uh, less lethal means uh, to stop violence. And we feel by, by uh, really focusing on, on particular areas as opposed to just uh, a carte blanche to clear crowds, which is not what we want to do, uh, but certainly it would, uh, it would assist us in stopping violence. Uh, and that's uh, that's where we're at, and that's where that's what our perspective is. Uh, you know, oftentimes if we if we see an officer on the line or what have you, and we were just look out into the crowd, and there's an individual or a group of individuals assaulting someone in that crowd, if we don't have that tool, then other than the officers, as the mayor pointed out earlier, uh, going using their batons, uh, their their wood batons, uh, and going out into the crowd when they would have otherwise had a tool that may have stopped that violence, uh, certainly uh, does it make, makes us less efficient. Jason, Jason, are you still on? Yes, Chief, I am on. You got any, anything further to add on that? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, I, would, uh, I would add to uh, the Chief's comments that uh, to answer the, the main question was what, what alternatives do we have? Other less lethal options include chemical agents, which that's a broader discussion, but I would say that uh, it's worth delineating uh, CS gas, which is the tear gas that was mentioned earlier. It seems like every time that, that gas comes up, somebody mentions the Geneva Convention. Um, and I do not say that tongue in cheek. I mean, it's a legit concern, I think, on the part of the community, but it's also a very valuable tool. I would uh, delineate that from also uh, oleo resin capsicum, which is pepper spray, which we also used in an aerosol fashion. So that is one alternative. The other alternatives are uh, the taser, which is not feasible in a situation where there's a crowd control uh, issue going on. Um, there, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong there. The, 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 the darts or the probes come out of a taser at an eight degree uh, one, one goes down at an eight degree angle, one goes straight. So they're, they're not flying straight. And if you fire it into a crowd, it could hit the wrong people. Um, and then you do introduce, introduce uh, neuromuscular incapacitation there too. So that person, if, if the taser is effective, is gonna go down, you need a team immediately ready to go and render aid. And per our policy, that person needs to be immediately transported to Valley Medical Center, which is not always gonna be an option in the middle of uh, civil unrest. Uh, and then the archaic, uh, 42 inch wood baton. So those are those are some of the other alternatives. Uh, we have already looked at things that we've done with our policy as far as uh, you know not necessarily using it for the dispersal or the movement of a crowd now. Uh, if, if it is deployed in the field in a crowd control situation or in a civil unrest situation, the use of those uh, force options or projectile impact weapons would be governed by the pre-existing uh, duty manual section, which requires them to either be armed with a weapon or requires their uh, their use in order to uh, defend somebody's life or to prevent somebody from being hurt. Thank you. Um, I was as, you know, I, I mean, honestly, I was as appalled as everybody else to see um, the use of rubber bullets on our own on our own residence and seeing photos of apartments nearby full of a few dozen projectiles and um, I'm not gonna say that we shouldn't be better because I think we should be better. Um, my fear, however, comes from a place of I'm old enough. <laughs> to uh, remember when the ACLU used to actually advocate for tasers. I don't know how many people remember that, but they actually advocated for tasers because they were uh, non-lethal, they were an alternative. And so, um, you know, my preference is to um, look for alternatives to lethal force whenever needed um, and so to leave that 
to leave sort of that uh, more clear definition of how or when that would be used as an alternative to lethal force, um, I would prefer if that were left to um, the reimagining, um, if there would, would be an opportunity to have sort of a subcommittee to look at this, um, to have that investigation and discussion around that because, um, again, I've certainly been around long enough um, to, uh, to see instances where people were advocating for some of these tools because the alternative was just so much worse. And, um, but I do think we need to be better um, as a city and that should not be a, a go-to tool. Um, that we use unless we absolutely have to. Um, I also wanted to um, to bring up the um, council member Adanas's memo to ask the chief if he had had a chance to look at that memo um, to integrate this work into our sexual assault response and strategy work plan. Chief, have you had a chance to take a look at that? Hello? Yeah, we don't. So we, go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. Councilman, are you talking about um, related to this, um, the duty yeah, our, the no duty manual or your, or the, uh, the memo that the council member put out about sexual assault? So this is the council member at NFS memo uh, titled the police department duty manual amendment. Yes. But it, but it, the subject was domestic violence or sexual assault. It hadn't, yes. it, it didn't, it wasn't regarding the use of force. Correct. It's about the duty manual. Yeah. Well, I, I looked at it real quick. I didn't pay too much attention to it because it wasn't regarding the issues today regarding the use of force and the and the prior memos that were related to this subject was there a, was there a question specifically about about that that's unfortunate because um yeah i i think we need to really raise the voice of our survivors um and we have an opportunity to make some systemic improvement um, so that her recommendation has updates to the uh, police department duty manual to review all domestic violence, child abuse, sexual assault, and human trafficking cases with potential high lethality to require officers responding to generate a police report upon the request of the survivor. Um, and that uh, she brought this recommendation forward after survivor called 311 and an officer responded but refused the request um, to, for a police report to document uh, the potential uh, temporary restraining order violation. Well, I don't know the specifics of that, that case that you just mentioned. Um, however, all those cases that you mentioned are um, reviewed in depth by our investigators. They're, they have to be, they're mandatory reported cases. In, in fact, they're assigned out to our investigators to look at. Okay, thank you. Well, then that should be easy then. So um, so I wanted to make a motion to move Council Member Arenas' memo um, and to move the memo written by uh, Mayor Ricardo, Vice Mayor Jones, Council Members Jeff, Jeff and Scott Asco, um, uh, and, and with the uh, idea of having the city manager's uh, office uh, look at 2A um, and coordinate on 2A with the uh, SJPD. So that's my motion. Mayor, is Dave Knopf, if I could just make one comment. Uh, uh, yes, Dave. 
Um, just regarding uh, your member and the vice uh, mayor's member and council members, Diep and Carrasco's member that was issued on August 14th under the recommendations 2B regarding the carotid restraint. Um, we've already amended the duty manual section that was placed into policy on June 9th, or, yeah, June 9th regarding essentially the exact same language that you have written. Thank you, thank you, Dave. Would you would you mind at some point just finding that language so that way we could hear it? Yep, I have it right here. That'd be very helpful. Thank you. So the the uh, the duty manual section that was put in regarding the carotid restraint use prohibition, it's uh, duty manual section L twenty six twenty seven, and it states uh, the carotid restraint which in which pressure is applied to the sides of the suspect's neck compressing the carotid arteries is prohibited as an authorized control technique to overcome resistance and shall not be used for this purpose. The carotid restraint may only be used by an officer as a deadly weapon force option. And okay, that, thank that you. That essentially, because there's a little bit more to it, but that's essentially what it says. I'm sorry, could, could you just say a little bit more to whatever's there so that we, we get the whole picture? Because we don't have access to the duty manual, so sure, be helpful for us then. So um, it will only be used uh, by an officer as a deadly force option. An example is when the force being re uh, being responded to is likely to cause death or seriously serious bodily injury. When the use meets the requirements of duty manual section L2602.1 deadly force. Um, and then it goes on and says the carotid restraint is not the same as a chokehold. It does not compress the trachea and therefore does not restrict the person's ability to breathe. Instead, the carotid restraint technique applies pressure to the sides of the neck in order to restrict blood flow in the carotid arteries and jugular veins, but does not compromise the airway, airway by placing pressure on the trachea. Um, and then the final paragraph, after the resistance is overcome with the carotid restraint, the suspect will be handcuffed to minimize the potential for further violence. The suspect should, be, should then be placed in the recovery position. Okay. So, so Dave, essentially the, the predicate for using this would be the same as any other deadly force, presumably self-defense of the officer or the defense of immediate threat of, of death to another person. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, I agree. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, raising that. Was changed in June. On June 9th. Okay, great. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate you clarifying for us. We had had um, some back and forth with community members, particularly at PAC, about whether or not, and it was our understanding that the change um, had not gone that far. So I'm glad to see that it clearly has. Um, so. I agree with you that the notion that it would be 2B would no longer be necessary. Uh, that would be moot. Uh, to be clear, uh, Councilmember Sparza, your motion was to refer 2A to the city manager. Is that right? Relating to rubber bullets? Councilmember Sparza, you may be on mute. We're not able to hear you right now. Uh, all right. Mayor, yeah, sorry, I got kicked off. Can you repeat that? Oh, I'm I sorry. That. Yeah, just to clarify your motion. Uh, so uh, Chief Knopf just noted that 2B appears to be moot at this point based on the state of the duty manual that was just recently updated. Um, and so the question I had was about 2A relating to rubber bullets. Was that the item you wish to have referred to the city manager? Correct. I, I honestly, my goal is that we have the spirit of what's in your memo, but that um, we have a little bit more study to ensure that it doesn't force the um, more lethal force in certain situations. Okay. Uh, and that was uh, that motion was seconded. Correct. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually second. I'll, I'll go ahead and second. Oh. I was going to second yeah, it. Sorry, sorry. I'll explain my rationale when the, my turn comes. Okay. Um,
council member uh okay i'm sorry and, and council member sparza were, were you through i, I didn't i didn't want to cut you off yes i'm done thank you okay i, I appreciate the senator uh, council member sparza which is understandably to to hear uh, fully from the police department about their view about this uh and reasonable minds can disagree and they do um let me explain why I think it's important so much so that I'm I'm not inclined to support a motion that would not include a ban of rubber bullets in use in crowded situations. Um, first, uh, it's important to distinguish what we have proposed in this memo and what we haven't. We have not actually proposed an outright ban of all rubber bullet usage. Uh, I think there are circumstances, and I think we recently heard about one in closed session where rubber bullets were used was not in a crowded situation um, and was appropriate uh, to attempt to disarm somebody who clearly was violent, uh, but uh, it was something short of deadly force. And it may be appropriate in other circumstances as well. The problem with the use in crowds is that no matter how well trained, based on what I have read and what I have seen, in our own use of rubber bullets, um, a well-trained officer cannot control where those bullets are going. And that is because, in part, because they ricochet. And we've seen uh, episodes of that, um, including bullets that have bounced into, apparently, I, I presume, I didn't watch the bullet, but presumably it bounced into uh, upper story apartments. Um, and because they're not made to be well aimed, unlike traditional metal bullets. Uh, and they are not fired in a manner in which someone would expect a marksman would be able to uh, hit someone reliably uh, who should be hit uh, if they're violent and attacking somebody and keep others safe. So the point is that in crowds, they're not safe. And, and that's not my opinion, that's the opinion of lots of other folks. Many cities have banned them, including Washington, D.C., quite recently. Uh, the leading medical journal in, in Britain, The Lancet, conducted an extensive study on the use of rubber bullets for crowd control. Um, and of 151 people who suffered from, from rubber bullets uh, injury, um, two died, uh, 59 incurred penetrating injuries of significant severity. And the abstract concludes that the inaccuracy of rubber bullets, the inaccuracy of rubber bullets, that's a quote, and improper aiming and range of use result in severe injury and death in substantial number of people. This ammunition therefore should not be considered a safe method of crowd control. Uh, a Kaiser Health report in 2017 studied all kinetic impact projectiles. Uh, showing a very high mortality rate, about 3% of those who were hit and 15% rate of serious injury. And again, it, it's not merely the fact that these less than lethal weapons are in fact lethal. Uh, we've seen evidence of that here in the United States, in Britain, in Israel, and elsewhere. Uh, but the fact that they are lethal and causing serious injury and not easily controlled. And that is what causes me such great concern. Uh, I know that the police department believes they can use their discretion in a crowded situation and hit somebody who is violent and attacking somebody and not hurt others. But the evidence I have from their use over two days or at least one day uh, in my own city is very much to the contrary. I know five people who were hit by these rubber bullets. I know for a fact that four of them were doing nothing violent. One of the people I happen to know because he was a journalist who got hit. Uh, so the police don't do a terribly, either the police aren't doing a terribly good job of aiming them or these are simply not weapons that can be aimed very well. And I can't help but believe it's the latter. I don't think everybody in our department is a bad shot. I think these are the wrong tool to use in a crowd. And I think we have to stand clearly for that. I understand the police would prefer to use them, but ultimately this needs to be a city that is governed um, by civilians for the benefit of civilians. 
We understand the police should have a seat at the table. We should listen to them. We should hear their concerns. Uh, but ultimately, we're here to protect our residents, and that should be our primary duty. And so I'm not going to support a motion. Can I ask yes. a question? So how um, does that differ from where it says prohibit the use of kinetic impact projectiles, um, i.e. rubber foam bullets, within a dense crowd as a measure of crowd control and to make this action immediate? How, how does it differ from from that language? Because the the current language in the duty manual allows their use in crowds to uh, hit individuals who are assaulting others. And so it explicitly um, says so. Doesn't this language actually prohibit? their use? Is it the use to singles? I'm trying to understand. It explicitly says only for crowd control. It limits the prohibition to crowd control and says, and I'll, I'll try to pull up the language here in a moment. Uh, I believe it indicates and uh, uh, Chief Knopf, feel free to fill in. So, I so believe under the current duty manual, it would allow uh, the use in a crowd against people who are committing assault. So the language is any, in any crowded setting versus within a dense crowd as a measure of crowd control. Is that, is that the difference? That's not the relevant distinction. This, the distinction I think that is relevant is between use for uh, against people who are committing assault in a crowded setting versus never using them in a crowded setting. And I think that is the distinction that I would draw between what is proposed in this memo and what the department has proposed. Can you say that again? I'm looking at page six of the yeah, staff. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going to try to pull up. You just said it would be helpful to me. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let me try to get that up on my screen. Uh -uh. So uh, you indicated page six, is that right, Councilor Sparza? Yes, of the staff memo? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you'd have to actually go down the actual language in the um, in the duty manual is all the way down in appendix F, which describes the actual duty manual language. And, okay. and it, it says here that nothing in this section is intended to prohibit officers from using a projectile impact weapon against a person in crowd control situations who is actively attacking an officer or another person or when an armed person poses a threat to officers or other persons. Uh, and then describes how to use a, a, a projectile impact weapon in a crowd. It says when aiming a projectile impact weapon at a violent individual during crowd control situations, officers are reminded of the responsibility for accurate round placement and their duty to avoid striking unintended subjects. The problem is I, I can tell you off the top of my head, five unintended subjects who were hit by our, our officers. And so I don't have a lot of confidence in our ability to avoid that. And at some point, the evidence is just too overwhelming because I'm not, <laughs> I know I didn't go and catalog every person who got hit. I just happen to know five people. Yeah, no, understood. I think, um... I was trying to understand because um, because I was looking at the language on item number six and then looking at the language on two a um, and so I, I um, so because because I don't I'm not sure that there's a difference here so that's why I'm trying to understand so yeah um, so then um, then the issue becomes the ability to use rubber bullets in a crowded setting if someone is violent. Is that right? Yes, and what I'm suggesting is they shouldn't be used in a crowd. Okay. And so, I have, can I ask a quick question of the chief? Is chief the chief still on? Yeah, I think we're both here, but go ahead. So, so then, um, because I think, frankly, we would all we all want to avoid the use of rubber bullets and avoid what happened um, before, where we we had 
couple dozen rounds going off in people's homes and and um, a lot of uh, bystanders getting hit. And so what I'm trying to understand then is um, if someone is violent to someone else in a crowd, then what are the options, right? Like we don't want to use rubber bullets, but then what? Because there's an issue of crowd control, right? And if you see someone hurting someone else, what are the choices there? Well, that's a great that's a great question, and, and just using the events of the 29th of May as an example, um, we couldn't enter that crowd to uh, affect an arrest on somebody that was was being violent either to police officers on the line or anyone else uh, due to the dangers that were were involved. Um, so you really limit your ability to affect a change in somebody's behavior when you don't have those tools available to you. Um, and to go off the mayor, you know, the mayor read very accurately what our duty manual, uh, amended duty manual section says um, to, and, and part of that is avoiding at all, you know, unintended subjects. The, the last sentence in there is, uh, in such cir in such circumstances, officers shall consider alternate solutions if the crowd density creates an unnecessary risk of striking individuals against whom uh, the use of the projectile impact weapon is not intended. Um, we would have to resort to other measures, which would leaves us really with a baton and begin then having to use and, and push a crowd to to get to either that victim or the suspect if at all possible. Um, and I'm not really sure how we could do that um, unless we're trying to break the crowd up using other measures like the, the CS gas or something else. Um, it just becomes very problematic in tying our hands a little bit. But isn't it practice to because I unfortunately have also been around a couple of riots in the east side, nothing at all like what we saw at City Hall. But um, isn't it practice to sort of contain it at that point? Contain a, um, a, an so, a, a outbreak like that? Yeah. And it's, yeah. Well, a, absolutely. Um, but when things become very violent, it's hard to contain um, that whole situation, especially what happened on Santa Clara Street. Um, you know, the dynamic was just very extreme in that situation in May uh, under the, the circumstances that were happening across the nation. So, you know, this wasn't just um, a group of people that were, were protesting uh, some national issue. This this had to do with the police also. So we were part of the, the issue that was out there and the, the violence was directed towards us. That, Councilor, if I can add uh, just real quick is that, you know, absolutes many times are, are somewhat problematic and I'll give you an example. There are some agencies that have uh, a shooting, a no shooting at moving vehicle policy where they can't shoot at a vehicle for any reason whatsoever. Our shooting vehicle policy is very scoped and narrow and basically uh, would allow an officer to shoot at a moving vehicle if it's meant to save lives. Uh, and that last part, and I'm paraphrasing what our policy is, but that last part is very important that some other agencies do not have. And so for some agencies that can't shoot at a moving vehicle for any reason whatsoever, they're stuck many times. Whereas if, if we need to save our residents' lives, if someone's plowing through people in a, in a crowd, uh, as happened actually um, during the protests, uh, our officers are allowed to, to take action to save lives without having the absolute of never doing something. And so that, that's simply what the spirit of what we were trying to, uh, to, to do in our policy. Yeah, and that's what I'm trying to understand. And so I'd like to hear from my colleagues before taking an amendment, if 
Um, so I'd like to hear from my colleagues first. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Davis. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the um, projectile impact weapons policy and the incidents that the mayor was referring to. Um, Captain Dwyer, my understanding was that the duty manual had changed after the, those incidents that at that time we, the SJPD was using the, um, the foam baton rounds for, um, for crowd control purposes and that, and they were actually aiming them at the ground and they were ricocheting. Is that, is that a fair, um, characterization of their use? during those days? So thank you for your, your question, council member. The policy was amended, I believe after the first or second day because the original policy allowed us to use 37 millimeter rounds, which we, we did skip off the ground. That's what they were um, put in our duty manual for, for that type of situation where we have mass uh, civil unrest in front of us and there's violence being introduced on the officers. Uh, but we, we almost ran out of those rounds. And it was an exigency that none of us foresaw. So the officers used those in the same manner that they would have used a 37. Um, they're very, I don't wanna say they're, they're very different in, in their composition, uh, but the previous policy did not uh, allow for us to do that until we realized, okay, this is a tool that uh, if we keep the policy the way it is, we, we are gonna be out of rounds after night one um, and foreseeing this for the next, few days, uh, the policy was amended. Uh, but you have to remember too, I think there's two things here. One is, it, you know, if an officer is targeting somebody to the mayor's point, then the other duty manual section is in effect. They either have to be armed with a weapon or, or that level of force, the intermediate level of force, which by, you know, according to the Ninth Circuit is, is force that's likely to produce a significant risk of injury, not deadly force or force likely to produce serious bodily injury, but but significant. Uh, and to paint paint a picture for you, a dog bite is kind of under the same umbrella. OC pepper sprays is treated the same way by the courts to, to varying degrees, but they're all considered non-deadly intermediate force. Um, so after that was changed, the officers did use those uh, in the same fashion that the 37 millimeters were used, but any officer that was targeting an individual who he or she perceived as a threat, you know, basically you're firing it at a person now, not, not necessarily skipping it off the street or off a sidewalk. They're subject to the, to the pre-existing duty manual section uh, that's, that's in existence today. And that was, that was in existence before May 29th. Does, does that answer your question? Um, I'm, I'm still a little bit confused. Were they, were, it sounds like there's two different kinds of rounds that you're talking about. Yes. Can you can you explain each of those rounds and how they were used in the first couple of days before the duty manual was changed and then after the duty manual was changed? So the duty manual, I know this is getting a little convoluted, but it's been changed a, a few times. So the first change was to allow for a 40 millimeter foam baton rounds to be used in the same fashion as a 37 millimeter round. The 37 millimeter round uh, was authorized not on actual people, but as a crowd control deterrent to fire it into the ground, um, thereby dissipating a lot of the inertia, a lot of the energy that would be introduced if that round skipped off the ground and actually hit somebody. The 40 millimeter round, uh, we started using that in the same fashion since then. Um, I believe we've taken the 37 millimeter off the table and the 40 millimeter, if it's deployed as the policy stands right now, if we, if we had civil unrest tomorrow, right, every city is just one incident away from having something happen where people come out and we're, we're, we're back to square one on May 29th. I think that we can all identify with that because we we were there, right? So if that happened tomorrow, according to the policy as it exists now, we would be able to deploy 40 millimeter projectile impact weapons 
but to the chief's point earlier and to the mayor's point, we would not be able to do anything other than target a, an individual that they could articulate is violent. And then the policy also states that, hey, if you're going to use this level of force, just understand. And, and it really goes along with the law changes that just came um, and accompanied deadly force. You know, we, we had to change our duty manual based on, uh, you know, legislation that was introduced at the state level, reminding officers the gravity of the force that they're using uh, in the field. So if that happened tomorrow, we, we could have those out there, but they would we would not be able to use them to move a crowd or disperse a crowd. I think the, the word that was used earlier was to contain a crowd. Um, I think a better word is to disperse it. There were so many people going in so many different directions and it was so chaotic. We identify containment as trying to limit people's movement. We didn't want to limit their movement. We wanted them to move in different directions and disperse the crowd to, to get away from that mob mentality. So did I, did I yeah, get close to answering it? Yeah, that's helpful. Um, and so if you, I mean, you mentioned the use of, um, of dogs, if, which as a dog lover is like, crazy to me i've seen the footage from the 60s and we, we will never use dogs for prowl control that's never going to happen okay great now, i'm sorry I, i'm sorry i shouldn't speak on behalf of the chief but i would tell you uh it's in our duty manually now it's in our duty manual now and uh we're we don't we don't we're not interested in regressing 50 50 years okay you, you can speak for me jason you're 100 right okay good i'm i'm relieved to hear that because i don't I, I share council member Esparza's um, desire to look at this further and to uh, maybe not make the decision tonight to, to ban something outright when the alternatives are, this is not an attractive uh, choice, but the alternatives are, are potentially worse. And that's my concern. Um, I, I guess I just don't, I, there is nothing. Council member, can I, can I offer, can I offer this? Yes. Uh, in any discussion of banning to the chief's point in, in absolution, not, not necessarily across the board because it is a very valuable tool in the field on day-to-day -day operations, but in a crowd control setting, I would offer uh, that any talk of banning it outright for crowd in a crowd setting, not for crowd control, because the the, the duty manual already precludes that. But in a crowd setting, uh, you uh, you just can't have that uh, conversation without talking about alternatives, and then go working through each and every one of those alternatives. And we are very limited in those alternatives, each and every one of them. And when we exhaust all of them, then where does that put us? And it's probably now going to be a tactical situation where we make the decision to either withdraw, um, which is you know, every solution creates a new problem uh, or close the distance. And now you're talking warm bodies up against warm bodies, which is another thing that uh, the less lethal projectiles allow is for space for us to not have the violent protesters right in front of us. So, I mean, it's, it, I would just offer that that discussion, we need to talk about alternatives if, if we're really gonna entertain doing that because we're, we're very limited. And I know that we mentioned uh, CS gas, OC blast grenades, tasers, batons, uh, flashbangs, which are, they're loud um, and they produce a, a bright light, but it could go off at your feet and it wouldn't hurt you. Um, you know, but after that, I mean, there's not really much else uh, out there. Uh, um, so I, I, I just would offer that. Thank you. Um, um, Councilor Davis, I just want to note that it's it, now 1158. Um, yep. I have a feeling we're going to be considering this probably on another day anyway. Um, do you, are you at a point where you think you could wrap up or you wanna use the remaining two minutes? <laughs> um, so I have a couple of unrelated questions that are unrelated to projectiles that are, mm -hmm. I'm happy to have wait until another day. Are we going okay. to defer to next week? What's your- Yeah, let, let me just suggest that uh, what we would do um, is, I think we'd say we continue the hearing. Is that correct, Nora? So that we don't start all over. Um, yes. And we go straight into Council Member Davis's questioning. Yes. Okay, and then we can continue to consider this. Um, I'm fine to 
continuing it for one thing? week or two weeks, whatever works for the chief and everybody else who needs to come back for this. One week, uh, my preference would be to come back next next Tuesday. Okay. And Councilmember Sparza, I know you've got the motion on the floor. Is that all right with you? Sure, one week or two week. And, and honestly, I think it's better because if there's anybody that wasn't didn't have a chance to speak because of the power outages, it would be great if we could offer the community another chance to speak on that day. Okay, um, <clears throat> in that case, do we need a uh, yeah, perhaps a, a motion to, and uh, is next week okay? Uh, Dave, I see you're probably looking at the calendar. I, I, of, I am. Um, <laughs> is that a busy one next week? Yeah. Um, just... I know we have community plan to end homelessness next week, I think. I think that's next week. Prop 16. Or is, or is two weeks better? Yeah, two weeks might, so we do have Prop 16. We have the community planned and homelessness. Um, I also have a land use issue that might take some public comment. <laughs> Not might, will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I think we've all received emails about that. So are we at the two week mark then? Yeah, keeping in mind, I think the, the following week <laughs> is commercial linkage, commercial linkage fee. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I don't know if it gets any better. What about the traditional Wednesday morning? If we don't think this will take more than another hour, hour, hour and a half, maybe on I, this. The last I, time. I think we can accommodate. We've, we've covered quite a bit of turf already. Uh, you know, why don't we put it on a Tuesday and, um, Hate to say it, bite the bullet. Pardon the pun. If if you if the if the council wishes to give us a little bit of maneuvering room on next week or the week after, I, I do. I will note that continuing to tomorrow morning, although sometimes we know that's super important, um, it's extremely disruptive to to our our process <laughs> when we do that. So um, yeah, and so. Um, if there is some flexibility, it looks like both weeks though are pretty busy, so it may not really matter. We may just come back next week then. So we could just take it back to rules, uh, so Dave, so you guys can have a chance to better look at the schedule. Would that be make more sense? That would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, would that be acceptable as a motion, Councilmember Sparza? Yes. Okay. Second. Um, thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you. And I just ask. Uh, Captain Dwyer, um, I know you listed several of the less than lethal weapons. I was just hoping perhaps in this discussion that is continued, just to be clear, I, I think we'd also want to consider acoustic weapons. I think you said tear gas, uh, pepper spray, um, flashbangs, uh, and concussion, concussion grenades, anything else that would be helpful to talk about, I think would be um, helpful for the council to understand the range of options. You know, in the interest of the uh, the late hour, I'll, I'll just make this brief comment. Uh, we found the flashbangs were very effective. Um, we we get a lot of inquiries at the police department about the LRAD, since you mentioned- well, uh, the Actually, I think, honestly, I think we're gonna probably be more open to considering all this information when you bring it all. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah, when we're actually thinking. Otherwise, we'll forget everything you just said. So <laughs> hold that thought, uh, and, and we'll definitely want to hear from you when we continue this. Okay, then uh, on Council Member Sparza's motion, uh, Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Prowlis? Aye. Dip? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Foley? Aye. Chemis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, we now have open forum. Paul Soto? Uh, 
Russell, I've been to, I don't know, a couple hundred hours of uh, council meetings from beginning to end. And I have never sat in one where there was so much reticence and so much um, big, ambiguous language being used. And this is the conduction of the city's business. And, and all of you know what you're talking about, but me as a citizen, because that's what I represent, I represent the citizen, I, I couldn't understand nothing of what you're saying. And so that I'm like, I feel like I'm being short -term. I feel like as a, as, a, as a citizen that you were determining the context in which I function and I live, but I'm not being made privy to it. And uh, yeah, so you all have a good night. Uh, thank you. And uh, Robert Aguirre. Yeah, Robert Aguirre here. Um, I, I would like to just comment on the, the fact that you decided to put together 4.1 through 4.4 and allow one minute of, of uh, comment from the public. But yet once that was completed, you broke everything up again and did each one of those separately. And it just doesn't seem fair to uh, the public that you do something like that. First of all, limiting the amount of time we spend. There are four different items on the agenda. They're not all one together. If you wanted them all together, you should have put them all one together. But to uh, tell the public that we only have one opportunity to speak for one minute, uh, it doesn't seem really fair. Um, and I, I think you should check on the, I don't even know if that's legal or not. I don't know. I don't know. I, I just don't know. But it doesn't seem fair to the public to do such a thing. And I think you should reconsider doing that in the future. Thank you. Captain Hedges. Um, I second what Robert just said. And um, I don't know, I'm just boggled by the whole discussion. And we, do, we just don't seem to be considering teaching the police how to de-escalate situations. So it's like, well, we need this tool or that tool, and nobody ever talks about, you know, we need to figure out how to, you know, you know, diffuse tension crowds or anything. I mean, that would be really cheap to use and wouldn't hurt anybody. And, you know, that's what we should be doing instead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Crystal? <laughs> Oh, I mean, hi, I'm Crystal Campisi, and I'm here to request a referral back to staff to consider waiving the marijuana business tax for medical marijuana card holders. Right now, medical patients are paying close to 35% tax on what would be medicine for these people. This is more than alcohol, gas, or tobacco taxes. So what's happening here is that it's taxing patients out of the ability to afford their own medicine. And it's driving medical marijuana patients underground to the black market where cannabis is untested and unsafe. It's putting our aging and most vulnerable communities at risk. And let me remind you, in the black market, no one pays any taxes. We're talking about prescriptions here for patients with cancer and chronic pain. Prescriptions are not subject to taxation. So what we'd like to do is get these patients back into the dispensary so they can consume safe products and pay their California excise tax. Please, re please have a referral back to staff to consider this motion. Thank you. Victor Duarte Vasquez. Uh, good morning. Um, you know, just listening to the council, just, just for us to like take a step back and also check some of the assumptions that um, the people were violent or aggressive or offensive in their manners and that the police just had to defend themselves when the reality is that we also see that there's agitation of violence that's being organized and presented in the way that we dress with all the gear, the tactical formations, the use of verbal violence that was recorded, the encouragement by some city leaders with their law and order rhetoric, and also has uh, decision makers for us to think about that when we see those tactical forms 
What is our role in stepping in and decreasing that? And what did the role of us voting for a curfew do to escalate the violence that we saw against our citizens? The reforms and trainings that we see uh, with military weapons and war chests uh, are always going to be positioned against people of color as we're the ones that need to protest to find justice. Think about defunding, too. Thank you. Scott Largent? Uh, good evening, actually. Uh, good morning, uh, San Jose. Uh, that was a uh, hard meeting to sit through. Uh, it doesn't seem like the police department's going to take responsibility for what happened. Um, what I see is going to happen out of this, you're going to have more people protesting out in front of City Hall. You're going to have more people out in front of the police department. You're never going to hold officers accountable. You're never going to change these problems. And you listen to the feedback from the deputy chiefs and the chiefs, they're not taking responsibility for any of this stuff. And the people I talk to all the time, that's the same feedback they're giving me from the police department right now. I'm, uh, I'm just very worried. And hopefully we can get a new chief in here pretty soon. We can kind of upright that department. Every day I see something new of somebody just getting whooped on by the PD. It's just really sad. The 800-pound gorilla is back in action, man. I thought it went to sleep a long time ago. So I love San Jose, just not the PD. Moto Jean? I just wanted to address a few things. One of them is that there's no respect for the public. This was supposed to happen after two and you pushed it all the way to nine o'clock without informing the public. You had an ad that said, uh, you know, do the census. You had it in the Chiron. You could have had in the Chiron, hey, we pushed this to the very end. I wanted to second what Robert and Catherine said. I also wanted to point out what an idiot somebody is to say that like a 13 bullets bounced from the ground to a second floor apartment, even after the police admitted in a written statement that they had fired on purpose. I also wanted to point out that you probably, Sam, experienced tear gas in a controlled setting, not in a panic setting with police running at you after concussion grenades and things like that. So your tear gas is completely different than our experience with tear gas. And the amount of PTSD amongst all of us is incredible. When I hear your voice, when I hear Eddie's voice, I completely lose my crap. And every single night before I go to sleep, I think about you and I lose my crap. So thank you, SJPD. Lucia Garcia. Hi, um, good morning. I just wanted to say something really quick. Um, I think we have to define what violence means, first of all, because I was in one of these protests and somebody threw a bottle of water. It landed near the police officers and they started throwing um, uh, rubber bullets. There were kids in the crowd and I was super worried about that. So I guess a good way to start is to first define what violence means to them. And another thing, I think we have to, um, I think you guys should show us how many people from the public is present because you have, you guys can see each other um, and we do not have information about that. And I think it's super important that we know, um, we don't need personal information to show up but at least a number. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby Gonzalez. Hi, uh, when the PD substation was initially drawn up, Chief Rob Davis submitted a plan to council to get the sworn staff to nearly 2000 officers. Opening the substation hasn't been a priority for a decade due to low staffing levels and we're nowhere near that 2000 officer mark. It doesn't make sense to fund a state of the art training facility so that the substation can finally be used as intended. While responses from the city have alluded to the training facility project being in its early phases, the budget shows that the project will start this fiscal year with completion slated for 2023. And I think this should be pushed back. The Measure T funds allocates funding for project five years out and it's imperative that we push back the funding at a minimum, if not removing the funding altogether until reimagining the delivery of police services process has been completed. Council can easily re redirect this money to the 1.6 million plus backlog of infrastructure needs and still remain within the approved Measure T language. Thank you. Uh, I can state uh, quite certain the project will not begin this year if it begins ever. Uh, D3. Hello, um, if you guys can't hear me, let me know. Um, good morning. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm a resident of D3, um, and I just have to echo a lot of what people have said already. Um, I felt like the language was very ambiguous, and I felt like questions, the same questions that were asked were asked three months ago or in June. So I was just kind of wrapping my head around like we haven't gone down this road in specifics. Um, I do appreciate uh, Mayor, you talking about the inaccuracy of the uh, projectile. So thank you for that. But um, again, there has to be a lot more. We need a little bit more time to talk about than one minute. Um, I don't know what else there is to be said that hasn't already been said. Um, I don't know what it'll take to get everyone's attention to know how serious we are about wanting to invest in our community and not the police. Um, we're a community and let's start acting like one. Um, there is a recent activity at my house where someone was trying to uh, break in into the laundry for a few coins and I'd rather use my car alarm to scare them off than call the police at this moment because I don't trust them and um, what they would do to someone who needs a few coins. Thank you. Uh, Kristen Suko. Hi, uh, my name is Kristen. I'm a San Jose resident. I just want to say I'm really appalled that at how much resistance there was for such a minute reform of just taking away rubber bullets, not even completely, but just in a crowd setting. I mean, it truly shows how you don't really listen to the public or the people because we have said over and over time and time again, the people who are there, you know, they were, they were, they got hit with rubber bullets and, you know, they weren't doing anything but peacefully protesting and, um, you know, using their first amendment. And the fact that there's so much hesitation to do even the smallest reform, you know, just even shows that we can't rely on you guys. We can't rely on the police. It just supports the notion more to defund the police because it, it's not reformable. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. The meeting's adjourned.